Chair Carvalho. Here. Vice Chair Boylan. Here. Regent Brown. Regent Downs. Here. Regent Tarkanian. Here. You do have a quorum. Thank you. Um, before I go to public comment, I just want to take this time to make one small change in the agenda. We're going to take item 17 before item 16. So essentially we're switching item 17 and 16. Next is public comment. Is there any public comment in Elko? Coming in Elko. Thank you. Public comment in Reno? And there's none in Reno. Thank you. Is there any public comment in North Las Vegas? Seeing none, I will go to item two, consent items. Um, before we take a motion on that, I would like to pull items B and C. Um, and I'd like to take those in reverse order too. Um, on item C, you may have found earlier this morning that there was um, a supplemental material that was sent out. There was a change to UNR's uh, budget. Um, to explain that, I would like to ask um, Mr. Vic Redding to come up and just walk us through that change. If, if that's okay with President Sandoval, I'm sorry about that. For the record, Brian Sandoval, uh, Madam Chair, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, thank you, Chair Carvalho. Uh, for the record, Vic Redding, Vice President, Administration and Finance, University of Nevada, Reno. And appreciate the, uh, the Chair's consideration in submitting this supplemental uh, agenda material. And my apologies to start with what I'm about to, uh, to put on the record should have been a footnote that went with the original report, which I think would have added a lot of context to what you're seeing. Um, but, but with the Chair's permission, I'd like to, uh, to uh, clarify the record on this item. Uh, the 2000, uh, excuse me, the 2023 summer session budgets. Uh, the information that you have in your packet is correct, but it's dated and incomplete. It shows the original summer budgets for the University of Nevada, Reno, which were correct at the time this data was pulled. Subsequently to that, we did budget revisions to prepare the campus for summer school. Budget revisions are not unusual. We do those almost every year. Usually they're immaterial. In this case, they were significant. Um, in fact, they equaled the amount of the original budget. Um, this has to do with a lot of true up in our campus, uh, some staff turnover, some timing issues that we had. So had we put the footnote on the record, it would say something to the effect of the original budget plus the budget revision that you see in that center column on the, uh, on the uh, uh, supplemental material make up in aggregate the total calendar year 2023 summer school budget. And if you compare that total to prior years, you'll see that there was no significant change in the level or amount of activity in our summer school budgets. Um, things are very comparable to past years. So uh, with, with that uh, correction for the record, thank you, Chair. I'll, I'll stop and see if there's any questions. Thank you, Mr. Redding. Uh, President Sandoval, did you have anything to add to that? Uh, Madam Chair, uh, for the record, Brian Sandoval, President of the University of Nevada, just to thank you for allowing us to, to supplement our materials for this agenda item. Of course. Um, and, and thank you for, for that clarification and that um, that uh, correction on that. So since we, I've pulled each of these out individually, um, do is it is it best to take a, a a vote on this item first before we go to the next? Jimmy Martinez, for the record, um, yes. Since these items were pulled, they should be voted on individually. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Martinez. Um, so with that said, I would entertain a motion to um, accept the 2023 summer session calendar year budget um, with, the, uh, with the clarification that was presented by UNR. Motion to approve. Thank you, Regent Boylan. Is there a second? Second. Second from Regent Brown. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Okay, and then going back to item B, um, 
I had a few questions on that one. Also for um, for UNR, and I, and I think that this would probably speak to all of the institutions, but I'll, I'll go to UNR first. Um, so on page eight of 14, um, on item uh, number two, on item B, uh, attachment number two, it shows that the ending balance is um, $3 million. Um, that, that balance seems a little high to me, so I'd, I'd like to ask for further clarification on um, what what is the intended use of, of those of that balance? Uh, good morning again for the record, Vic Redding, Vice President of Administration and Finance for the University of Nevada, Reno. Uh, summer school uh, as a non-state supporting activity um, has to Eat what it eat what it kills. It, it has to generate all of its uh, of its own revenues to support the activities associated with it. Um, many of the items that you'd think of as direct expenses, the salaries, the uh, the course materials, you'll see in the expense category. There's a lot of indirect activities that are associated with providing the courses, um, the uh, the tutoring center, the math center, the writing center. Uh, departmental operating. In fact, this is probably uh, one of the most significant sources of departmental operating. So while you'll see an ending balance, or uh, in, in many cases on the, uh, the prior report you were looking at, you saw transfer outs. Those transfers out stay within the university, but they're returned from the central summer school department to the actual academic departments for use uh, um, uh, at the discretion of those deans. So at, at least at UNR, that's how it works. I suspect it's very similar at most institutions. Thank you, Ms. Mr. Redding, for that clarification. That one just seemed a little bit higher than the others, so I, that's why I, I, I asked for your um, explanation on that. Thank you. Um, I do have also another um, question regarding um, Truckee Meadows um, budget to actual. It, it's interesting to me that 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 the 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 budget and the actuals are exactly the same. Um, I was hoping that someone from TMCC could help explain that. Mr. Alexander, thank you. Thank you very much, Regent Carvalho. It's a pleasure. Um, at TMCC, uh, as at the other institutions, uh, summer is a self-support uh, operation, and ours is very healthy and robust, I'm pleased to say. Uh, the accounting eccentricity you see in the table there is actually an artifact of TMCC's method of sweeping the funds after the program has completed and placing those funds in reserve. And in those reserve accounts, uh, the funds uh, remain. And so the actual uh, that you see there is zero uh, at the beginning. And uh, mysteriously, it does appear that the uh, costs equaled uh, the revenues uh, right to the penny. Uh, this is simply an artifact of having swept the proceeds of over half a million dollars into reserves uh, where they remain. Thank you for that explanation. Um, were there any other questions um, for Vice President Alexander or, or any of the other institutions regarding this item? If not, I will entertain a motion to accept the 2022 self-supporting summer session calendar year budgets Budget to actual comparison. So moved. Uh, thank you, Regent Downs. Is there a second? Second. Second from Regent Brown. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Um, and so now I will go to item A, minutes for possible action. Are there any um, questions, clarifications, comments on the minutes? or a motion? Motion to approve. Second the motion. Thank you, Regent Brown and Regent Downs. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. All right, now on to item number three, second quarter fiscal year 2022-2023 fiscal exceptions. Chief Financial Officer, Mr. Andrew Klinger. Thank you, Chair Carvalho. For the record, uh, Chief Financial Officer Andrew Klinger, um, I will just highlight the, uh, the fiscal exceptions that are included in the second quarter report for fiscal year 2023. Uh, at the University of Nevada, Reno, the ASUN uh, Wolf Shop reported a deficit of 1,075,715. 
dollars uh, at the College of Southern Nevada. The dental uh, faculty practice uh, reported a cash deficit of $836,630. Uh, at Nevada State College, the Early Childhood uh, Education Center reported a deficit uh, of $126,472. Uh, and at Truckee Meadows Community College, there were several accounts that in total uh, reported a negative cash balance of $112,235. Uh, and finally, at the University uh, of Nevada Las Vegas School of Medicine, uh, they reported a negative cash balance uh, at the end of the second quarter, totaling uh, $4.4 million. Um, that negative cash balance oh does gosh. include uh, outstanding uh, invoices uh, in the amount of uh, $5.7 million. And with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Klinger. Are there any questions from the committee or other regents attending? All right. I, this is information only, so we can move on to item number four. Second quarter fiscal year 2022-2023 budget transfers, state supported or self-supporting operating budgets. Mr. Klinger. Uh, thanks, Madam Chair. For the record, Chief Financial Officer Andrew Klinger. And in the uh, second quarter, uh, there were no transfers uh, between functional areas to report. Thank you, Mr. Klinger. This was also information only. Were there any questions or comments regarding this item? Seeing none, I'll move on to item number five, the Enchi Real Property Inventory Report for calendar year 2022. Uh, Mr. Klinger, would you like to present that? Sure. Thank you, Madam Chair. For the record, Chief Financial Officer uh, Andrew Klinger, uh, before the committee uh, today, uh, and this is uh, under the Board of Regents handbook, we're required to report this annually to the board. And so this is the calendar year uh, 2022 report. Uh, this is an inventory of all of the uh, real property uh, assets of the system of higher education. Um, and you can see in the report, it's broken down uh, between the various uh, institutions uh, that hold the property. With that, be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Klinger. Are there any questions or comments from the committee members or other regents in attendance? I, I do have one um, <clears throat> observation, excuse me, um, that I, I like to discuss regarding UNR's holdings. I see that they have uh, a large um, amount of holdings compared to our other institutions. I would like to um, ask President Sandoval if he has any comments regarding that. Thank you, Chair. Uh Brian Sandoval, president of the University of Nevada, Reno, for, for the record. It, you know, I, I suppose there are several explanations. One, we're a 149-year-old institution, and through the generosity and support of many of our donors who have uh, donated property to our, to our campus, you know, an example of that being the recent um, transaction with the Sierra Nevada University to, to us. Second, um, with regard to cooperative extension and the fact that we have operations in all 17 counties would, would explain that, um, that uh, we have holdings in all the counties throughout the state of Nevada. Third is a, an original land grant university again. Um, that would explain um, why we have uh, so many different holdings. But an example today further, I think it's agenda item 14 within um, Today's BFF uh, agenda, we are selling a piece of property in Ruth, Nevada, in uh, a very fine town in, in east, northeastern Nevada, but um, a very obscure one. And as I'll explain, um, you know, we really had trouble finding even somebody who was interested in acquiring that property. And we're finally able to find somebody to, to pay $20,000 for it. it was a, it's in a dilapidated condition. So we are um, constantly reviewing the inventory of our properties and if there is an opportunity um, to, to sell any of those that would be ad advantageous to the university um, as well as to a, a potential, potential seller, we would, we would do that. But um, hopefully that's responsive to your question, Madam Chair. 
Yes, thank, thank you, President Sandoval, and, and just want to echo what you said, that this is a testament to the type of, of institution that, that UNR is. Um, you also hold, hold um, water rights and mineral rights that um, in some ways can be a benefit to the university as well. Um, so we do appreciate the, the, the generosity of donors who through the years, the 150 years that UNR has been in existence, um, their generosity has, has has helped this institution further its mission. So I do want to thank you for that. Um, and with that, I also, I had another question um, that I think probably is, is suitable for new business, but I thought it was interesting that our um, foundation holdings are not included on this as well. So I, I think that that's something that um, to increase further transparency um, and oversight on the board, I think it's important for us to also understand um, the holdings that our, that our foundations have as well. Um, so I will uh, include that in, in new business later on in, in this uh, committee meeting. Um, yes, Regent Perkins. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just a quick question. Um, I don't know if it falls in here or in new business. Um, before we sell a property, do we look at the other institutions within the system that might be able to like generate a trade? So, you know, to, to trade that property rather than selling it to somebody outside the system. Do we do that? Uh, Michael Wixom, Special Anchi Real Estate Council for the record. Uh, we, it's my understanding under board, that under board policy we do not do that, but I would note for the record that all property owned by the system is held by the board for the benefit of specific institutions. So in fact, all, all title is vested. There are some historical anomalies because of, uh, of what's happened in, in the way that the, the system is named through the years. But for purposes of this discussion, all real property assets are held by the Board of Regents for the benefit of a specific institution. And so there really wouldn't be a transfer of property from one institution to another institution because the board owns it anyway. Understood. I guess I'm asking because I know there was um, a while back it came to my attention that um, one of the institutions needed some property and it, it, they, did, they didn't realize that the property was always, already owned by us. So maybe more of a systemness. I don't know. That's Michael Wixom again for the record. That's one of the reasons that years ago the Board of Regents instituted the report on real property holdings so that the institutions would be aware of what was held and so that for informational purposes we would understand as an institution. The institutions now have a resource that they can look to and see what's there to uh, accommodate that specific concern. Perfect. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Thank you for the question. Regent Boylan. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, maybe uh, I should ask uh, Mr. Wixom this since he is here. It's, it was something I'd asked before. Uh, is there a way, and it may be a new business, that we can get not just uh, all the properties, like you said, it's really held by the board for the whole system. So back to my uh, question that I had a few meetings back, what happens to the money when properties are sold? I still haven't got any clear answer, and I know according to Mr. Urquiaga, the regent himself or herself must ask the president of, that, that's kind of cumbersome, that doesn't make sense. If it's one thing and belongs to the whole system, we should have somebody who can give us that answer, the whole system. So, Mr. Wixom, thank you. Uh, thank you, Regent Boyler. Michael Wixom, again, for the record. Unfortunately, there's not an easy answer to that question. And the reason is that in some cases, President Sandoval alluded to the fact a few months ago that vast amounts of property were deeded to the system pursuant to testamentary trusts, for example. And typically, those trusts will require include requirements as to how the property is to be used and also the disposition of proceeds from any sale of the property. We addressed that issue in connection with the main station farm several years ago. So in, in that regard, uh, ultimately the board of course has control over the disposition of proceeds, but the disposition of proceeds from any the sale of property can't be grouped together with one specific answer because it's a function 
of the way that you received, in many cases, title to the property and the restrict restrictions applicable to the property. And in that regard, the system has tried for many years to get a handle on what restrictions would be in place. But the problem is indicated by the inventory that you saw earlier is that you hold, again, vast amounts of property in the state. It's almost impossible we would have to dedicate, I, by we, I mean the system would have to dedicate several employees, employees almost full time just to go through all of the deed restrictions applicable to the property. In that regard, the only way, practically speaking, that you can address the deed restrictions is on a transaction by transaction basis. So if we're looking at a specific property, that gives rise to review of the deed restrictions to determine if there are restrictions and how the proceeds should be applied. Um, and so, I, I, again, I, I wish there were a simple answer to that question, but there's really not, unfortunately. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I apologize. I always ask the difficult questions that don't have easy answers, I guess. But it's, it's really important to follow the money. We're talking about millions of dollars, and I'm not talking about, you know, the deeds that say, okay, this is for a specific property. Okay. Let's have that too. We have how many, how many thousand employees? I'm sure we can, Mr. Klinger only has a few. I, I don't know what it takes to get the answers. To me, it's just follow the money. The government has been able to catch terrorists by following the money. And I'm not saying anyone is a terrorist here, but if we can follow the money, at least we know where millions of dollars have gone as a, as a system. Individual things, I understand, yep, they were handed to only that university or college, but where does that money go? That's what I'm asking about. I'm not asking about deeds and things like that. I want to know when we sell a property, where does that money go and where could we use, maybe we could use it to add to the Native American fee waivers. See, funding, ma'am, where is she? She's gone? Okay. <laughs> Oh, you're right, and that and also for the National Guard or something. But where does that money go? I haven't seen any, any list. Sorry, go ahead. Difficult, I know, sorry. Michael Wixom again for the record, Regent Boyland. Typically when uh, a transaction is brought to you for approval, there's an explanation when the transaction is brought to you for approval where the proceeds are going to be used. So that's why I'm a little curious about the question. Because whenever you see a real property transaction, part of the briefing materials will explain to you, for example, if a property is sold for a million dollars, we plan to put the million dollars in this fund or apply it in this way. And so that would be part of the, the approval that you receive whenever uh, a transaction is brought to you for approval. If there's a, if a, if, if a specific institution asks the board to sell property for the benefit of the institution, there'll be an explanation in the board briefing materials as to the disposition of the proceeds of the sale. So you'll know then where the money goes. Madam Chair, one, one last one. Okay. I, and I thank you for that. That helps me uh, a lot, wee bit kind of, you know, thing. So uh, <laughs> lots of these deals have been done before I was on this board or any of these other regions were. So should we just forget those? And we don't know where that money has gone. Maybe it was said that it would be allotted for, do we have any uh, written stuff saying this was allotted to this? Thank you, ma'am. Michael Wixom. Wixom for the chair. Uh, you, all you have to do is review the word minutes for the transactions. And so the transactions, when, when, the, when the particular parcel of property was sold, when the institution requested the board to approve the sale, the board minutes will reflect where the money was to go. So it's easy to follow that. You just have to, if you have a specific transaction, you just need to go to the board minutes for that transaction and the board minutes will tell you where the money went. Thank you. Uh, Regent Boylan, um, uh, CFO Klinger would also like to address you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yes, for sir. For the record, Chief Financial Officer uh, Andrew Klinger, uh, Regent Boylan, so when you had asked this, this question before, we did survey uh, the institutions, uh, and we do have a report for last calendar year, so calendar year 22, we have a, a real property sales report that we'll distribute to to the regions. Now, it doesn't go back in time because um, I think as uh, Mr. Wixom has talked about, you have to go back and sort of do the research on these, but we did collect the information for last calendar year, and we'll, we'll send it out to all the regions. Madam Chair, 
Uh, thanks, Mr. Klinger. Uh, we talked about that, and I think we agreed it would be at least the last three years. So if we did one, maybe there was no sales in that one year, this last year. I don't know. Maybe there was. But is it possible, since you've been able to do one year, to just add the numbers for two more years so we can see what happened? Uh, in, you know, if you follow the past, you can tell the future is kind of what I'm saying. So is yeah. that possible? Yeah, please. Regent Boylan, it, it, it is possible. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Klinger. And I also want to share, <clears throat> excuse me, Regent Boylan, that I've, I've heard your concern about this and I have made sure that um, briefing papers include that, that I've discussed with each of the institutions when they bring agenda items forward with real estate transactions that we make very clear um, where the money is coming from or the where the money is going to. I agree with you that we need to make sure that we enhance um, accountability and transparency and um, as long as I'm in this seat then I will I will make sure that we can continue to do that uh, thanks ma'am I appreciate it see I was trying to say all that but you said it much better thank you well said thank you any other questions yes Regent Del Carlo uh, thank you madam chair and I'm also not on this committee Regent Del Carlo and this question would be uh, from you mr. Wixom I think to, to Regent Boylan's point, I think he's just trying to see see where the money goes. And I would say as a general statement, and, and please correct me if I'm wrong, Mr. Wixom, but I would say generally over the course of years and years that when a property gets sold from an institution, any of our eight, it I would say generally goes back into that institution, and yes, the briefing paper tells us what. I remember the farm, uh, sale of the acreage at the farm, I think it was 112 acres for around 20 million, and at the time, President Johnson was trying to upgrade his labs, and they determined they weren't going to use this property, and it was a difficult decision for the board, but that money went back to that university. So as a general statement, would you say that when a property is sold from an institution, the money and the proceeds usually go back into that campus, that institution? Uh, thank thank you. you. Michael Wixon, for the record. I, I, I think Regent Daryl Carlo, generally speaking, that's an accurate statement. It will go back to the institution in one of several ways. It could go back into a general property acquisition fund, for example. I believe each of the institutions has, has a general fund that they use for acquisition opportunities for real property. In, in some situations, it will be applied to specific debts. For example, UNR at one point in time sold real property and applied the proceeds to uh, retiring a debt with the Fire Science Academy or other debts. And so, uh, but as a matter of course, my experience has always been that you'll be told in the briefing materials, we're either going to use this property to go back and do a general fund, we're going to use it to acquire replacement property, we're going to use it to retire a debt. I mean, and certainly, the board can ask for more specificity in terms of when it goes back into a general property fund, you could ask, for example, how you plan to use those funds or where you plan to use them in the future, what the intent is. But generally, it would fall into one of those three categories. It would go back into a general property acquisition fund held by the institutions. It would be used to uh, acquire uh, proceeds from one sale would be used to acquire specific property in another situation or it would be used for a specific purpose, for example, retiring debt. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for that clarification. Any other questions or comments regarding item number five, the real estate, real property inventory report? That's information only. I'll move on to item number six, 2013A and 2013B bond refunding resolution. CFO Klinger. Thank you, Madam Chair, for the record. Chief Financial Officer uh, Andrew Klinger. And what's before the committee today uh, is a resolution authorizing uh, the issuance of bonds. Um, the resolution requests uh, authority up to $86,875,000. Uh, and, and this issuance will be used to refund uh, existing bonds. Um, currently, our debt management guidelines require uh, a minimum savings of 3% uh, of refunded par value in order to consider a refunding. Uh, based on market rates uh, as of January 20th, uh, the proposed 
refinancing is estimated to generate present value savings net of cost uh, of approximately 5.6 million or 6.4% of the refunded par value. So we look for your approval of the, the bond resolution so we can refund some existing bonds and uh, save some money. Any questions or comments? Regent Downs. Thank you, Regent Downs, for the record. Uh, thank you, Chair Carvalho. Uh, so I, I, I'm going to ask a question that, uh, about property sales. Why don't property sales go to pay off bonds instead of, um, I mean, that's another source of it, right? I mean, well, why do we take bonds for some activities on campus versus others we sell property for them? Madam Chair, for the record, uh, Chief, Financial, or Chief Financial Officer uh, Andrew Klinger, I think it just depends on the transaction. Um, so if you used uh, bonds to purchase property or to build property, uh, and then you sell that property, then you're required, um, usually per the, the bond covenants, to, to pay that bond off. So I, I think it just it depends on the transaction, and I think Mr. Wixom could, could probably add more to that as well. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Klinger. Michael Wixom again for the record. I, that's exactly right. There are some, as a general matter, sometimes bonds are not prepayable without penalty, for example. And so it, as a, it's hard to say that as an overall practice, you should take, for example, all proceeds from the sale of property of one institution to pay off bonds because some of the bonds may not be subject to prepayment from a long-term perspective. There may be advantages to keeping the bonds in place on a long-term basis. It's more an issue of financial management and how you plan to utilize the funds. So that would be a function of uh, discussions between the financial officers at the individual institutions and Mr. Klinger and the chancellor to determine what the most effective way would be uh, to, to pay the bonds on an ongoing basis. From a larger perspective, one of the advantages of having the system structured, the way it's structured, is uh, the smaller institutions are able to leverage the size of the institution to get better rates. So a smaller institution, if it were issuing bonds on its own because of the size of the institution, would have to pay a higher interest rate because it's a smaller institution. But by aggregating the assets of the system as a whole, uh, smaller institutions are able to get better interest rates, for example. So that, that affects in how you, how you structure bond repayments. So I, I, I hate to be obtuse, but from an overall perspective, it really just does depend on the transaction and the financial health and status of the institution and the objectives that it's trying to reach financially. Does that answer your question, sir? It does. I mean, I guess my other question about that, I assume then there's a strategic look at inventory of properties per institution and upcoming projects they want to have completed, and they can decide, should we sell this property to pay for this new project, or should we take bonds out? Is that the type of discussion that goes on? Madam Chair, uh, with your indulgence, Michael Wixom again. My experience has been that all of the institutions engage in those discussions. All of them have discrete uh, needs and objectives uh, that differ. And, and so they're going to have to look at their financial status, what they choose, what, what their plans are. You'll see later in the day, for example, the, the campus master plan for Nevada State College its financial needs are going to differ because of its unique situation and what it seeks to achieve on that campus. And so it will handle property transactions differently and bond repayments differently than would UNR or UNLV or DRI or the, the other institutions. And, and those are discussions that, in my experience, have always been robust on an institutional level, and they always discuss and, and interact with the financial officer, Mr. Klinger, and the chancellor. And so it, it, and it helps, once again, from a system perspective, because you're able to utilize the resources of the system as a whole to lower the overall interest and offering costs from a financial perspective, but also have the flexibility to manage individual objectives for the institutions. And so which is actually, I think, historically, historically worked out very well for the system and for the institutions. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions or comments? I will entertain a motion. So moved. A motion from Regent Boylan. I'll second. 
Thank you, Regent Brown, for the second. So we are, um, uh, this is a motion to request approval or for approval of resolution allowing NSHE on behalf of UNLV and UNR to issue up to 86,000 or 86 million eight hundred and seventy five thousand dollars of fixed rate tax exempt revenue refunding bonds to refinance the existing 2013 a and 2013 B bonds for interest savings all those in favor please say aye aye, aye. aye. opposed motion carries item number seven Handbook Revision Delinquent Accounts. CFO Klinger. Thank you, Madam Chair. For the record, uh, Andrew Klinger, Chief Financial Officer. So before the committee today is a proposed uh, amendment to the, the Regents Handbook, Title IV, Chapter 17, Section 2. Um, and what this uh, requested um, amendment to the handbook would do is currently uh, in the handbook, uh, a, a student uh, or a former student who has a, um, a delinquent account um, is unable to receive a, a transcript uh, of their record or a diploma. And what the proposed change does is it adds language um, that basically requires them to enter into a, a, a payment plan. And if that student enters into that uh, payment plan, then they can receive their, um, their transcript or their diploma, which is currently um, not allowed. Um, the other portion uh, of the change uh, requires the establishment uh, of an appeals process uh, at the institutions. Currently, the, the uh, handbook policy does not um, contemplate an appeals process, so it also uh, adds an appeals process. So this is really an attempt to allow students who would otherwise be unable to get their transcript if they had a delinquent account to enter into this payment agreement, uh, which then they will be, then be able to uh, receive their transcript. Uh, and just some of the, the data that we have um, on the number of students with, with delinquent accounts, um, the current data that we have is there are about 26,000 um, students who have delinquent accounts. And to, to give the committee uh, just an idea of sort of the median balances that students carry. Uh, so for example, at UNLV, the, the median balance is $1,151, and it varies by institutions. Uh, UNR, $967. Uh, and you look at the lowest, it's actually WNC who has a median balance uh, for their students of 587,000. So um, this is an opportunity again to allow students to, um, to receive their transcript without having to pay that debt off. They do have to enter into uh, a payment plan. The only other thing I would add is there is currently a, a, a bill um, in the session AB 212, uh, which would, if passed, would require the board to establish policies and procedures to essentially to allow students to receive their, uh, their transcripts. So if, if this policy is approved today uh, and then this bill passes, we will have already actually established the policy that the, that the bill requires. With that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Klinger. Regent Downs. Thank you, Chair Carvalho. Regent Downs for the record. Uh, so uh, Mr. Klinger, with this policy, if a student entered a payment plan, and now they can activate their records or access them. And then they stop paying. So they, they got their transcripts sent and then they don't make another payment. I mean, is that something we're concerned about or they turn it on and off again whenever they want to get a record, they make another payment? For the record, Chief Financial Officer uh, Andrew Klinger, that, that is correct. They could do that. So in other words, a student comes and enters into a payment plan, receives their transcript, um, doesn't make good on the payment plan and then comes back in a year and wants uh, another transcript, um, they would have to enter into another payment plan. Now the tools, the tools that the institutions uh, have, um, you know, certainly can send these to collection. I mean, that's, um, and I think the institutions do that in some cases. Um, so you still have those tools uh, available. Um, the question is, 
does this policy then will it increase the the number of delinquent accounts out there i mean i don't know that's that's hard to say what what the impact would be uh, on that thank you thank you regent boylan thank you madam chair i think that's a great question that he uh, regent downs uh, brought up I, I think it's funny too actually really good but if uh, Mr. Klinger can explain this AB, what did you call it, and what, what's that about again? Uh, Assembly Bill 212. That's in the- 212, That's yeah. in currently being considered uh, in the legislature. And what's it about? Uh, it basically, uh, Assembly Bill 212 uh, would require the board to establish policies so that students could, would have access to their, their transcripts. So what we are doing right now, what you just told us. It, it would require you to adopt that policy. Uh -huh. Outstanding. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Regent Boylan. Other questions? Yes, Regent Brown. Uh, Regent Brown, for the record. Um, this one's obviously tough. I mean, Regent Downs, you make a good point, right? What's to stop a student from getting their trans their uh, transcript and then not making the rest of the payment. But then I took a, a step back and you gotta look at from the view of the student. I don't believe that there's any student that graduates or approaches graduation and chooses just not to make those final payments for something to go on their credit, which stays with them for when they're entering the workforce. So there has to be some kind of economic reason why they're not making these payments. And I think withholding their transcripts would actually prevent them from entering the workforce in higher paying sustainable jobs. And so I would be in favor of you know, creating some type of, maybe it's a, it's an education to this, like talking about what credit means, talking about what it would be if they default, um, and offering some type of, um, you know, guidance, uh, with, with students who do enter into payment plans. Thank you. Regent Perkins. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Just, uh, um, that brought up an interesting, um, a, a, a thought when, um, Regent Brown spoke about the graduations. Um, is there a way, how many of those students that have a delinquent account, how many of those actually graduated? For the record, Chief Financial, Chief Financial Officer uh, Andrew Klinger, I don't know the answer to that. I'd have to, we'd have to do some research and, and get back to you on that. I'd appreciate that because that might make a difference in why they're defaulting, um, that maybe they had to stop out or drop, stop out or something, you know, something happened. So that'd be interesting to see if we are preventing them. I'd be curious. Thank you. Thank you. I have a question. Um, <clears throat> if any of the business officers are here and have this information, I know it's it, it might be um, more difficult uh, on the spur of the moment, but I was wondering if um, the temporary suspension that happened during the pandemic has increased the number of delinquent accounts um, for students. I would be curious to know if that, if that was a yeah. triggering factor for some of this. If anybody is, is able to speak to that. I see somebody coming up to the podium. Thank you. Uh, Chris Vuitton, Associate Vice President for uh, Financial Services and Controller at UNLV. Uh, for UNLV, the suspension, uh, we expected that it would, but fortunately, the, uh, we, you might recall the federal government provided a lot of resources to aid students impacted by uh, the impacts of COVID. So those, those, mo most of those funds went to students that would have otherwise been impacted and our delinquent accounts uh, were not affected. Yeah. Thank you for that feedback. I appreciate it. Um, I, I'd also like to say that, that um, I'm, I'm in support of this uh, revision. Um, it's important to recognize and make improvements um, as we focus on continuing to be a system that's equitable and accessible to all of our students. It's also important to note that the external ec economic environment has affected all of us with special consideration for our students. So I believe this is a mutually beneficial change for students and institutions. And I believe that if this revision um, causes a detriment to our institutions, we can come back and, and make changes that are necessary. With that, are there any other questions or comments regarding this revision? No. Regent Tarkanian, did you have something? 
Yes. Um, is there a time limit on this? A time limit on this revision? In other words, mm -hmm. please go ahead. If someone doesn't pay, can they just let it not be paid at all ever? The reason why I'm bringing this up is because I just recently, I think NBC, I'm not sure if it was NBC, did a rather large survey of students and what they would do if their student loans were uh, alleviated. And in those student loans, in the replies that were made to that, the money wasn't going for education or even to pay back a lot of things, except it was going for vacations and clothes and things like that. Our initial reaction is we want to help the students so that they can get work. But evidently, there's more than that from what the pollsters are finding in their surveys. So I just wondered, is there an end? Can you say by this time it has to be paid? Thank you for that question, um, Regent Darkanian. Um, Mr. Klinger? Yeah, thank you, uh, Madam Chair, for the record. Uh, Andrew Klinger, Chief Financial Officer to uh, Regent Tarkanian. So with each individual payment plan, it would have an end date in it. So as the students entered into these um, payment plans, there would be a, um, you know, a, a term, if you will, of each one of the individual payment plans. So there's not a, not a term limit necessarily in the policy other than it requires them to enter into these agreements, which would then have an end date. So all, the agreement itself would have a, a term ending. That is correct. Thank you. Thank you for that question, Regent Arcanian. And, and I'll also <clears throat> elaborate that each of the institutions um, has the flexibility to go about um, uh, uh, collecting this debt as, as they find necessary. So obviously their bottom line is important to them and, and, and they would do what they need to do to, to, um, to finalize this debt in the way that they think is most appropriate. Um, Regent Downs. Thank you, Chair Carvalho, reaching down for the record. So I, I don't know if I should have addressed uh, Mr. Klinger about this or someone else. If, uh, according to this policy, does it give the institutions the flexibility to, for example, have an administrative fee associated with setting up some kind of a payment plan so that would discourage students from stopping and restarting and stopping and restarting that every time they did, they'd have to reestablish an, an administrative fee? Is that, is that something that's, that's possible to, to try to keep the process going? For the record, Chief Financial, Chief Financial Officer uh, Andrew Klinger. So the way the, the policy is drafted currently, um, it does not include that. And I will also say that uh, Assembly Bill 212 actually um, does not allow that. If, so if, if Assembly Bill 212 passes, it has specific language in there that basically states you cannot charge a student with a delinquent account more. So I believe you could not charge a, you might be able to charge an administrative fee. I don't know, we'd have to look at it, but just sort of off the cuff, I don't think you could. Thank you. Regent Perkins. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. I would just like to add that the Con uh, Consumer Finance Protection Act recently did an examination of um, withholding transcripts for delinquent fees, and they found that it was it's an uh, abusive practice. So we're right in line with by changing this, by endorsing this policy, we're right in line with what the, uh, the federal government believes. Thank you for that addition, Regent Perkins. Any other questions or comments? I will ask for a motion. I'd like to motion to approve. Thank you, Regent Brown. A second from Regent Boylan. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. <clears throat> All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Regent Tarkanian was your, yours was an aye. You, you are in favor of this. Okay, thank you. Um, all right, that motion passes. Thank you. Item number eight, revised interlocal agreement between the College of Southern Nevada and the City of 
Henderson for lease at the West Henderson Center of Excellent Excellence. President Zaragoza. Madam Chair, Regents, colleagues, and guests, welcome all to our North Las Vegas campus. For the record, I am Federico Zaragoza, President of the College of Southern Nevada, and thank you for this opportunity to request approval to make several revisions to the current CSN, City of Henderson Advanced Manufacturing Center of Excellence lease. I've been working on this project since my first day on the job, so I'm very pleased that we're so close to making this uh, project a reality. By way of background, after two years of planning and collaboration with many partners, including the City of Henderson, the Haas Manufacturing Company, CCSD, GOET, and Workforce Connections, amongst others, CSN and the City of Henderson first brought this project to the Board of Regions on December 2021. At that time, we presented information to the Board on the Center of Excellence model, which is designed to create a talent development ecosystem that will produce world-class technicians to help support and go the Southern Nevada manufacturing sector workforce. For the record, LVGEA reports that there are more manufacturing jobs in the pipeline in Southern Nevada than from any other industry sector. The Haas a company alone predicts hiring approximately 3,000 employees and an average wage of about $27 an hour upon completion of their manufacturing facility. Regents, the City of Henderson and CSN, uh, the CSN Advanced Manufacturing Center, uh, which will be located in the Haas facility footprint, will contain state-of-the-art labs and the equipment necessary to train incumbent workers as well as to produce new generations of Southern Nevada CNC machining, PLC, robotics, megatronics technicians, et cetera. The center will also provide a one-stop environment for City of Henderson and workforce connections to assist both students and companies to connect to training opportunities. Almost a year later, at the September 2022 Board of Regents meeting, the board approved a 20-year lease between CSN and the City of Henderson. The lease also provides CSN with options for four additional five-year lease extensions. Since then, the City of Henderson has approved an additional $2.5 million for furniture fixtures and equipment uh, to support the, the center operations. However, the City of Henderson and CSN Legal Counsel identified the need for several lease clarifications that explicitly address the following areas. One, a revision was inserted to include an estimated occupancy date of April 1, 2023, noted in Section 2. Uh, and for the record, we do expect a certificate of occupancy uh, later this month. Number two, revisions uh, of the definition of CSN party or parties to include enrolled students, noted in section 3H. We inserted a correct exhibit A, which specifies the proportion and location of space dedicated to each of the parties or shared party areas. And number three, CSN agreed to carry environmental pollution liability insurance related to the advanced manufacturing training programs. And for the record, uh, the cost of the insurance is approximately 15,000 for three years or 5,000 per year. Uh, the cost of the insurance uh, uh, is uh, secured from CSN operational revenues to include grants and contracts. Regions, this is truly a unique a project that will provide CSN with a no-cost, world-class advanced manufacturing training facility that will help us to produce a skilled manufacturing workforce that is critical to the growth and diversification of the Southern Nevada economy. Therefore, I respectfully request approval to authorize the Chancellor to execute the lease provisions as provided in the board materials. Madam Chair, I would be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, President Zaragoza. Are there any questions or comments from the committee or other regents? In the spirit of, of asking where the to follow the money, as Regent Boylan has said, um, I just wanted to put on record, um, Presidency, um, where will I know that the 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 costs associated with this facility are very nominal to CSN, but I'd like to ask where um, where will the funds come from um, for those costs associated with this. Yeah, again, the vast majority of the current cost, uh, for example, uh, 
Uh, we already have received a $2 million grant from a GOAD that supports the equipment itself, and now we've got an additional $2.5 million for FF&E. So much of the operational infrastructure is fully funded already through grants. Uh, the vast majority of actual services provided in the Center of Excellence, because it includes a lot of contracts with business and industry uh, for incumbent worker trading. Uh, uh, again, think of this in terms of uh, uh, the advanced manufacturing skills that are required to maintain a productive workforce. So the center of excellence is where companies will send their existing employees uh, for training uh, uh, and for uh, certifications necessarily uh, to, 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 to basically keep their, 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 their production uh, lines open. So a lot of that will be contracts with business and industry. We also will get a lot of WIOA short-term training grants that will support training there. Plus a third revenue strand is that there will be a credit component and there will be some alignment uh, to your previously approved uh, Associate Applied Science degree training programs in manufacturing. So it's multiple revenue sources, again, that support the operations of train, uh, uh, centers like this. Thank you for that further clarification, Presidency. I appreciate that. Any questions or comments? Yes, Regent Brown. I'd just like to make a quick comment that I am very much looking forward to this opening and I'm excited to visit um, later in the spring. Appreciate that. Thank you. Regent Downs. Thank you, Chair Carvalho. Uh, Regent Downs, for the record, I, I, I think it's a great idea and it's it's wonderful to see the, the public-private partnership there that uh, we're able to get workforce going and uh, impact more people in the area. Thank you. Thank you. Regent Del Carlo. Thank you, Chair. And um, I'm not on this committee either, but I think this is terrific. And I think it's a real game changer to help diversify the Southern Nevada economy and not be so reliant on gaming and tourism, as we all know, really crippled our state during the pandemic. And I know there's hearings in Congress right now. There could be another pandemic, God forbid. But uh, this is is uh, solidifying the future of the, uh, the economy down here in the South, which is our economic engine for our state. So thank you for all the work you do, Dr. Zaragoza. I know that uh, when we hired you, you came in with a vast background and knowledge of workforce development, and you have not disappointed. So thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Regent Del Carlo. Regent Boylan. Thank you, Madam Chair, uh, Dr. Zaragoza. Did, did I hear you say something about advanced manufacturing? That is correct. Could you tell us some more? Um, I love that. That was one of my things that I ran based, you know, I was one of my things in my right. election. Advanced manufacturing, like Regent Del Carlo said, we need to really diversify. So can you tell us some but, more yes, about we, that with your permission, what, Madam Chair? Advanced Chair? manufacturing typically uh, is associated with 4.0 manufacturing, which means that it's automated. Uh, if you look at the kinds of occupations that, that, that we're going to be uh, uh, focusing in, for example, CNC machining is computer numerical control programmed uh, uh, machining processes. PLC is kind of the, the brain behind the manufacturing processes. Robotics, uh, 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 as you know now, are, are integrated systems. And then mechatronic technicians, which are kind of these uh, highly specialized individuals that help set up and maintain all of these complex systems. So we're providing advanced, world-class technicians in these areas. And I want to emphasize that uh, many of the new companies coming in, into Southern Nevada are world-class uh, employers. So they expect world-class uh, 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 production processes in place, and that's where we're aligning our programs. This is not just true to uh, obviously CSN. We see that from our sister institutions uh, uh, up north and throughout the country. This is a niche for community colleges, uh, and we work hand in hand with the industry because the idea is for us to stay uh, uh, in the same uh, uh, kind of uh, speed as industry and to make those adjustments almost on a real time basis. So that would be the advanced manufacturing environment that this center is going to be operating. In. Thanks, uh, Dr. Zaragoza. I think uh, you've confused some of us some more, but it's awesome. I love to hear <laughs> it. It's outstanding. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? I will entertain a motion to approve the revised interlocal agreement between the College of Southern Nevada and the City of Henderson for the lease at the West Henderson Center of Excellence. So moved. Second. Uh, Motion from second. Regent Downs, second from Regent Boylan. Yes, All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Thanks. 
Thank you. Motion carries. Yes. <clears throat> Number nine, new lease between the Desert Research Institute and the Department of Energy for a portion of the Rogers building. President Acharya. Good morning, Chair Carvalho and members of the committee. Uh, for the record, uh, Kamur Acharya, President of DRI. Today, we're requesting your approval to enter into a new lease with the Department of Energy for a portion of DRI's Roser Science and Technology Building located at our Las Vegas campus. The Roser's Building, which was completed in 2003, was planned from the start as a partnership between DRI and DOE. Accordingly, the Board of Regents approved a similar lease with the U.S. General, General Services Administration prior to the building's completion. That lease is now near the end of its 20-year term Rather than ex exercising their right to extend that lease, the DOE asks approval of this new lease before you today, which replaces the GSA as the leasee with, with DOE directly. Otherwise, the lease terms remain essentially the same, except that the new lease is for a shorter period and it provides for increased rent to cover DOE's share of addition of buildings O&M costs. DRI's partnership with DOE in the Rosas building is very important in several ways. It recognizes and strengthens uh, DRI's working relationship with DOE, a relationship extending over half a century. It provides a home for the Atomic Museum, newly named Atomic Museum, it used to be called Atomic Testing Museum. And it provides space for records relating to the operation of the test site and makes those records available for many Nevadans that worked on the various programs of the test site. And it provides a repository for DOE's archaeology artifacts collected from the test site. That program is operated by DRI. This new lease is for a five-year term with five additional one-year extensions allowed. The lease provides for full reimbursement of the DOE's prorata share of the building's operating cost over the period. I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. And Peter Ross, DRI's Assistant Vice President for Campus Planning is standing by in our Reno as well for any questions. Thank you. Thank you, President Acharya. Are there any questions or comments related to this lease? No? I will entertain a motion to approve uh, the lease between uh, the Department of Energy as part of the Rogers Building on DRI's Las Vegas campus. Motion to approve. Second. Motion from Regent Brown, second from Regent Downs. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Item number 10, U.S. Department of Human Services, Health Resources and Services Administration Grant Notice of Federal Interest, Buildings B and D, Shadow Lane Campus. President Whitfield. Thank you, Chair Carvalho. Keith, uh, for the record, Keith Whitfield, President of UNLV. UNLV is requesting your approval today to execute the Notice of Federal Interest on the UNLV Shadow Lane campus property. The UNLV Dental School was awarded a $2 million grant from the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services from Human Services Health Resources and Service Administration, or HRSA, to build a unique outpatient clinical facility named the Advanced Needs Dental Clinic. This facility will provide care for those Nevadans with special needs while also giving dental students the opportunity to develop knowledge, values, and skills to provide care for special needs patients within their general dental practice upon graduation. By approving the execution of the NFI, the federal government will be able to record a lien against the Shadow Lane campus which is a requirement when providing funding for a substantial improvement to or construction on real property. Additionally, the UNLV Dental School can begin construction on the facility. I offer this for your consideration. Thank you, President Whitfield. Are there any questions or comments from the committee or other uh, regents in attendance? I, I just wanted to add a few things. First, um, 
I think it would be beneficial for the full board to hear a report on who and how this clinic benefits the Southern Nevada community when it's finished. I congratulate Dean Ma from the dental school for bringing this forward. I think that this is an important clinic for our community and um, I look forward to, to seeing the success of it. Um, specifically on this, this item, normally we, we, we frown upon having any liens or encumbrances on, on real estate that we have um, within our system. Um, so I'd like to um, ask Mr. David Froma from UNLV to elaborate on that for us um, and, and give us an update on, on where we are with, with that lien. Yes, thank you, Chair Carvalho. Uh, David Fromer, for the record, Associate Vice President of Planning, Construction, and Real Estate at UNLV, a very long title. It's good to see you all, uh, board members and members of the committee. Uh, one thing I'll offer is we do have Dr. Uh, James Ma, the interim dean of the medical school in the audience, so if it pleases the board, he certainly can offer a few remarks about what this clinic will do for the School of Dental Medicine and for the community. Uh, related to uh, the question asked by uh, Chair Carvalho, um, uh, this is a bit of new ground for us. We have not secured grants in the past that required some kind of encumbrance of our land in exchange uh, as a guarantee that the grant will be applied and used uh, per the intent of the federal government. Uh, we did do some research with uh, our partner institutions at ENSHE starting there about uh, if they had encountered that, which had not been the case, and other institutions around the country. Uh, but uh, the general uh, basis is the federal government is providing $2 million for a capital and equipment grant for a clinic, and their interest is to make sure to have some encumbrance against the land so that those funds and those improvements are used as intended, which is completely understandable. Uh, there is a process to place the notice of federal interest against the title. The process to remove it is not quite as clearly defined, which is something that caught our attention as uh, real estate and capital project professionals. So uh, at the request uh, of Regent Carvalho, I did follow up with the granting officer from HRSA yesterday and talk this through and uh, confirm that there are no very defined guidelines about how these encumbrances are removed. Uh, it's a request by request basis. Uh, what I did talk with the grant officer about is when we send in the notice of federal interest once recorded against title, uh, we may have the option to send a non-binding memo associated with that. Uh, the uh, HRSA would not accept it as a binding document, but it would describe our process to remove the encumbrance when the time was appropriate. So generally speaking, our sense is the removal of an encumbrance for a capital and an equipment grant is likely going to be at the end of the useful life of that improvement and uh, that equipment. Uh, there's the possibility that we could reduce the encumbrance midway or some uh, interim step uh, with the federal government just to have something on the record to say the million dollars has been depreciated or the two million dollars uh, has been depreciated by half, half its useful life. We might seek a reduction of the encumbrance down to $1 million uh, just to have something as an interim step because these improvements tend to last and you know, have a useful life of 20 to 30 years. I think it's fair to say that many of us in the room may not be in our current roles in 20 or 30 years as well as the HRSA grant officer. So we are just looking for options that are compliant with the federal process to at least express our intentions or have some interim steps. So that is uh, how we're approaching it uh, with re uh, respect to the, the lack of a very defined process to remove any encumbrance. Thank you, Mr. Frommer. Mr. Wixom, did you want to add to that? Uh, Chair Carvalho, if I may, thank you. Uh, Mr. Frommer and I have had a number of discussions on this particular issue, and I think, uh, and we've been on the phone together with, with the federal grant officer, and this really, the bottom line is if you want the money, you take the encumbrance. And we really don't have any other choice in that regard. And, and while the federal government is in the process of trying to delineate more specific rules and regulations for the removal of such an encumbrance, that those aren't in place right now as a general matter. What we were told, as Mr. Frommer indicated, is that will, it will generally follow the depreciation of the asset. So over time, as the asset depreciates, the federal interest will correspond 
correspondingly depreciate. One suggestion I was going to make is given the complexity of the situation and the fact that it's come before the board, my suggestion would be that when Mr. Fulmer, if assuming that the board approves this item, that when Mr. Fulmer sends this letter on behalf of UNLV, that a copy of that letter come back to you as chair and that it be included as a consent item in the next set of minutes so that there's a permanent record in the board record so that if anyone in the future, if we need to find this information, it will be readily accessible because as Mr. Fulmer indicates, we likely won't be here, but whoever will be looking for it will have an e easy way to find it. And, and so that there won't, so there'll be a way to track through so that we understand what to do to remove the lien. I think that's the best we can do. Thank you, Mr. Wixom. I, I would agree with that. Um, are there any questions? Regent Brown. Uh, Regent Brown for the record. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, so with the lien on the property, this makes sense. They're giving us $2 million. They want us to make sure that the $2 million is being spent. Looking at the budget, you have about 5% uh, allocated for miscellaneous and contingency. If that creeps into the 6 7%, is there a way to go back and get like a budget reallocation where we are still in compliance with the lien? Uh, 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 Regent uh, Brown through Chair Carvalho, uh, we can certainly look at the budget and see if there are differences in allocations within the $2 million, if there's a way to adjust any approach to the encumbrance or the grant. My general belief is, and again, this is a bit new ground for us, and I think this is a a great opportunity because I think the hope is we'll have more of these grants over time, so having a process defined. But my general sense, and again, this has to be validated, is that the federal government is really looking at it as a $2 million overall award. So the encumbrance will probably be related to the entirety of the $2 million award. Uh, in the grant administration process, I believe that there's the ability to go back to the federal government to say, this was an estimate, and we may spend a little bit more money on construction and less of equipment or on contingency or ancillary items. But I think my sense is the federal government's really looking for the outcome of you're going to deliver this improvement for this service. And that's really where their focus is on the overall project. Do you mind? Um, th thank you for that. I, I have personally dealt with federal grants before, and they've been very particular about things. That's the only reason why I ask yeah. is if there was a contingency for, for UNLV to go back and make sure that we are, we do stay in compliance. And if we do slip out of compliance, is there like a POC where you go and you say, hey, we've got to do a rebudget allocation. But yeah. it sounds like you guys have thought about that. And so that was just the, that was the only question I had. Yeah. So yeah. And uh, for the record, David Fromer, uh, uh, UNLV, uh, great question and uh, good to hear about your experience in administering uh, the federal grants, <laughs> Regent Brown. Uh, you've, you've, uh, you've held up well in consideration of uh, <laughs> a difficult process. But that being said, uh, that would probably be handled through our Office of Sponsored Programs, who generally works with the grant requester on any of the grant administration and grant compliance. So a very good point, and I believe there is a process in place through the, the OSP office, as they're called, for any modifications and a request for a change in scope or something like that. Thank you. Thank you for that question, Regent Brown, and the clarification, Mr. Frommer. Any other questions or comments regarding this item? I will entertain a motion to approve Mr. Wixom, did you want to say something? Oh, pardon me. I was Sorry. just going to uh, suggest again that when you entertain that motion, that part of the motion be that Mr. Fromer's letter come back to you for part of your minutes. So pardon me for interrupting. No problem at all. Thank you for that clarification. <clears throat> so I will entertain a motion to accept the, uh, the notice of federal interest, but that in addition to that, um, I would like to request that UNLV attach a non-binding document that NG through UNLV intends to pursue a removal of that notice of federal interest within a reasonable amount of time that reflects the useful life of this improvement. So with that said, I would entertain a motion. So moved. Thank you, Regent Downs. Is there a second? I second it. Second by Regent Boylan. He beat me to the punch. So. <laughs> All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you.
Item number 11, Men Memorandum of Agreement with the UNLV Foundation Special Purpose Entity for Management and Operation of the Run and Rebel Plaza at UNLV. President Whitfield. Thank you, Chair Car Carvalho. And for the record, Keith Whitfield, President of UNLV. UNLV is formally requesting to enter into a Memorandum of Agreement, or MOA, with the UNLV Foundation Special Purpose Entity, or SPE. This will grant the Foundation SPE the ability to maintain ownership of the running Rebel Plaza until the property becomes vacant and UNLV is able to pursue development of the property in accordance with the Campus Master Plan. The MOA is necessary and beneficial as the Foundation's SPE is a more suitable organization to own and manage operating commercial property acquired by UNLV. UNLV has embarked on a long-range planning effort in the area where the property is located, which is generally known as the Midtown Corridor. UNLV's objective in acquiring the property was to, to enhance amenities and develop needed infrastructure and facilities that benefit all stakeholders and the community. With all this in mind, I respectfully offer this for your consideration. Thank you, President Whitfield. Are there any questions or comments from the, the members of the committee or other regents? Regent Boylan. Thank you, ma'am. Now, when we say this is another organization that's going to run it for us, uh, could you explain that? I'm not really up on real estate stuff. Can we, um, can we, can we have a say in how they run it? Or, well, it's like bada bang. It's theirs. Nobody else can say anything. Uh, good morning, uh, Regent Boylan through Chair Carvalho, David Fromer, Associate Vice President, Planning, Construction, and Real Estate at UNLV. So a very good question, and I can give you a little bit of additional context related to that question and kind of the primary purpose of this uh, request to the board or to the committee. So uh, we acquired this property uh, earlier in 2022 as a strategic acquisition for the university. It's right across the street. It's at a major crossroads of the entry to the campus. Uh, there are operating businesses there. It's a commercial real estate property. Uh, Chipotle is one of the tenants there, Cagino's Deli, some very popular uh, uh, businesses and small local businesses. Uh, so really the purpose of this is we own now a commercial piece of real estate that has a commercial purpose with the intent long term of owning the property so that at some point when it's appropriate to redevelop the property, maybe the improvements or the asset is fully depreciated, maybe it's no longer a marketable uh, facility, UNLV would own it and be able to redevelop it for academic research, community service, campus service, whatever purpose makes sense. Uh, universities uh, proper are not typically the entity you would have manage a day-to-day -day commercial real estate operation. That's not what universities and board policy and governance are designed to do. So, But foundations that exist for the benefit of the university typically are suitable for that to run a commercial real estate property. So the general basis of the uh, request of the memorandum of agreement is our foundation, the UNLV Foundation, created a special purpose entity, the SPE, essentially to create an organization under the foundation that has some liability protections and separation to manage this property. We would move the ownership of this property into the special purpose entity, and the agreement in the MOA has a variety of requirements of how they operate that property. And their focus, it's not to redevelop it, it's not to make it different, it's to operate the property and the agreements that are in place today to pay the expenses of doing that, and there are expenses of utilities and broker's fees for new leases and operations costs. And then at the end of the term, essentially UNLV would request the return of the property to UNLV for a redevelopment activity and any excess revenue that has been collected along with that above the expenses of running the property. And then UNLV would get the property back and the, re the revenue generated over the life of the operations under the SPE for redevelopment. Uh, UNLV also maintains the option, because this is not unusual in uh, uh, higher ed public education foundations, that we could work with this SPE 
where they would retain ownership of the property and they would redevelop it as a developer and then UNLV would be a tenant in there and in that instance any revenue collected that existed over time would go into the development activities to help reduce the cost of development based on the revenue collected over the years of the SPA operating it. So there are guidelines. They have to operate the property, keep it at a reasonable condition. They cannot redevelop it. Really, the, the, the operations would be running it as is, or if a tenant leaves, trying to lease it out to a new tenant so we don't have vacant spaces. Uh, that's really the guardrails in place for this agreement. Thank you, Mr. Frommer. If I might add one more thing, can we make a regulation, because I've met a lot of students in my favorite Chipotle is there, <laughs> that they don't take that away, because I've talked to them, a lot of them. So keep it, because that's the only one I go to. Can we do that, boss? Yeah. I'm sorry, I, I didn't quite hear the last part of that. I, I love Chipotle, too. Uh, they're a great uh, lunch option. Uh, are you looking for free Chipotle for the students, Regent Boylan? <laughs> Shh. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Regent Boylan. Uh, Regent Perkins. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I want some of that Chipotle action also. Um, the, how, is it lined up? Is it, is it spelled out how the property comes back to UNLV? Uh, it is in the MOA, and I'd have to look up the specific page. Uh, the university can request the return, and there's a certain time period, I can't say if it's 90 days or 180 days, that the property would have to be returned back to the university. And again, any remaining revenue collected after expense over the life of the agreement comes back with the property. Uh, so there is a term, and I could find it uh, specifically, about how we request it and the parameters of it returning to the university. Thank you. I must have missed it in that how many page document, but thank you. <laughs> thank you. Regent Brown? Thank you so much. Um, I have a comment and then a question. Obviously, I, I support changing the legal structure. Um, it protects the university. It protects ENCHI from liabilities from the tenants that aren't owned and operated by ENCHI. Um, separate or having the separate organization hold those liabilities makes sense. Um, but then you actually said a second piece to this in your comments um, to my colleague, which was the redevelopment piece. And I am fine with a, a separate entity monitoring it until the lifespan, until it's depreciated to the point where we do want a redevelopment. But at that point, I would like to know if UNLV will automatically get it back and then they'll have to figure out redeveloping or if this separate entity has the opportunity to possibly redevelop it and then give it back to UNLV. Yes, uh, thank you, Regent Brown through Chair Carvalho. So that, and again, I'm trying to find the uh, statement, and I will, related to the return of the property, but that is all at UNLV option. So the base condition is, is that UNLV requests the return of the property and the SPE provides it. The language in there says, or as otherwise directed by UNLV or something to that effect. And again, I can find the language. So the SPE does not have the authority to redevelop it on their own. UNLV can request the property back. They would have to give it to us. If UNLV determined that we felt it were in UNLV's interest for the SPE to be the redevelopment entity, we would negotiate with the SPE to do that. But it is UNLV's determination. The SPE would not have that authority to redevelop it without UNLV saying, we want you to and we authorize you. And that would require a whole other suite of agreements as well, which in my belief, and I can certainly uh, maybe perhaps ask uh, uh, Special Real Estate Council Wixom, if the SPE were to redevelop the property related to this agreement, I believe a whole bunch of new agreements for a redevelopment would have to come back to the Board of Regents. And I don't know if uh, Special Council, Real Estate Council Wixom might want to comment on that. Thank you. If I can, Chair Carvalho, uh, and through the Chair to Regent Brown, that is in fact the case. And the transfer sections are located in Section 6 of the document. That's on page 10 of 25 on the board materials. But the bottom line is that the board will maintain control of this process. And for them to develop the property would require an entirely different suite of agreements that would have to come back to the board. 
in that regard, and you would have to implement controls and procedures to effectuate that development so that it was consistent with UNLV's master plan and your intents for the property. And as, as President Whitfield and Mr. Frommer indicated, this was a strategic acquisition and any development would have to be consistent with the strategic objectives of the institution. And if I may add to that, David Frommer, for the record, uh, thank you, uh, Special Counsel Wixom. Uh, page 10 through 11, section 6B, is the term for the return of the property transfer from operator to UNLV. I certainly won't read it, but that is the section to look at related to that specific term. Um, and thank you for that. And, and I, I just wanted to ask the clarifying question because I do not want to see any of our institutions circumvent preva prevailing wage by doing it this way. So if it would have to come back to UNLV and then we'd have to look at a, a, a slew of other contracts, then I'm totally comfortable with this. Thank you so much. Thank you, Regent Brown, for that question. <clears throat> other questions from the regents on the committee or other regents? I do have one um, question regarding the briefing paper. Um, President Whitfield or, or Mr. Frommer can answer this. In item number three, specific actions being recommended or requested, the very last sentence um, there says, President Whitfield requests that the board waive any applicable NG policies or procedures that may be inconsistent with the subject transaction as presented to the board. Um, I'd like to ask for further clarification on that waiver, please. Uh, certainly, uh, Chair Carvalho, thank you for bringing that up. and. You know, that is an abundance of caution because the intent here is to transfer the property to the SPE, who is better positioned for the day to day oper operations of a commercial real estate enterprise. So we just, uh, we did consult with council on that point, and I think uh, council was in agreement that. Uh, stating that explicitly so that there was no misunderstanding that the SPE and their governance structure uh, under the uh, development of that SPE by the UNLV Foundation would be the governing uh, approach and the governing the governance structure uh, and uh, so that it's very clear that this is an SPE governance and not a Board of Regents governance for the day-to-day -day operation of the property, a commercial real estate property. Thank you for that clarification. Any other questions? I'll entertain a motion for approval to execute the memorandum of agreement that will transfer ownership of the property uh, to the foundation SBE with including the, the, the aforementioned discussed um, waivers that were that we would like to have. Um, motion to approve. I'll second it. Thank you, Regent Brown, and thank you, Regent Boylan. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Item number 12, sale of a portion of real property located at 4505 South Maryland Parkway at UNLV. President Whitfield. Thank you, Chair Carvalho. And for the record, Keith Whitfield, President of UNLV. UNLV is requesting the approval of a sale of a portion of the Maryland campus property to the Boring Company. The partial, the parcel which is about 1.3 acres, is located on the corner of Tropicana and University Center Drive. Under the terms of the proposed sale, the Boring Company would purchase land to construct a station as part of the Vegas Loop transportation system. This system will serve as a personalized mass transit option consisting of 69 planned stations incorporated into a 65-mile tunnel system. Once built, the UNLV station would serve as a main connector to Allegiant Stadium, as well as connect UNLV to multiple destinations, such as the Las Vegas Convention Center, the Strip, and possibly the Harry Reid Airport, and the Las Vegas Medical District. The transportation system would provide UNLV students the ability to commute to employment centers throughout the Las Vegas Valley. And with us here today is a representative from the Boring Company, Tyler Fairbanks. And I think that uh, he has a statement from the Boring Company that we'd like to have uh, submitted for you all. Thank you. Welcome, Mr. Fairbanks. Great. Thank you, President Whitfield. 
uh, Tyler Fairbanks, head of project development for the Boring Company. Um, I think President Whitfield just did a great job explaining um, Vegas Loop and the benefits of connecting UNLV into the Vegas Loop system. Um, but just to reiterate, Vegas Loop is a subsurface transportation system um, that will expressly connect UNLV into various destinations here in Las Vegas uh, along the Vegas Loop system. Um, to date, the Boring Company has built and is currently operating 2.2 miles of tunnel and five stations here in Las Vegas. Uh, that system has four stations at the Las Vegas Convention Center and one station at Resorts World Las Vegas. Uh, we have actually moved so far nearly a million passengers. We will likely hit the million passenger mark uh, next week. Uh, specifically, we've moved 995,000 passengers so far. So um, operations uh, in Las Vegas um, to date have been going very well. Um, we're excited to partner with UNLV on this land purchase. Um, the, the purchasing this site on UNLV property will accelerate the, con the connectivity of UNLV into the Vegas Loop system. We've partnered with UNLV in the, in the past. Specifically, um, we, we uh, partnered with UNLV uh, on a tunnel boring competition where we hosted hundreds of students from around the world here in Las Vegas, uh, and they basically raced tunnel boring machines. It was a huge success, um, and, and I think a great, uh, great testament to the partnership between UNLV and the Boring Company. Um, additionally, the Boring Company has hired many UNLV uh, graduates as full-time employees, as well as uh, many UNLV current students as interns, and we look forward to continuing to use UNLV as a talent pipeline uh, here in Las Vegas. Um, Finally, uh, the Boring Company team is really excited about this partnership with UNLV, uh, and we look forward to getting UNLV connected into the broader Vegas Loop system. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Fairbanks. Um, Regent Boylan, did you have a question? Yes, ma'am. Uh, Mr. Fairbanks, welcome. Thank you, uh, Boring Company. Now, since we are, you're not boring, but you're the Boring Company, yeah? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, since we're giving out a wee bit of land, we're not getting any money for it, right? Uh, uh, Dr. Whitfield, yeah. So since we're doing that, uh, is it possible for us to get discounted tickets for our students who use that? You know, specifically students. You know, can you uh, kind of uh, swear an oath that they'll get a discount so they can travel, you know, save some money? Is that possible, Mr. <laughs> Fairbanks? Um, or Dr. Whitfield, so whoever. So for the record, this is Keith Whitfield, president of UNLV, um, to you, Regent Boylan. Um, let, let me finish my little pre-prepared statement because it actually addresses something that you've raised. So in addition Thank to the you. appraised value of the property, UNLV is seeking some measure of compensation for the land and the value of replacing the parking that will be taken up. Should approval be granted, UNLV and the buyer will negotiate a purchase and sale agreement, and that will be completed sometime before June 30th. With all the benefits of the sale of the property uh, will provide, I respectfully offer this for your consideration. Does that um, answer some of your question, Regent Boylan? Madam Chair, it, uh, it answers the, you know, just the wee bit or the beginning part, but I'm more interested in can we get a discount for students, specifically for students to travel that boring company tunnels and things all over, which is awesome. I love it. But is there any agreement we can make? Let's shake hands and say, all right, you've done it. Yeah, we will certainly work with the UNLV team um, on, on, on. That's a good idea. Order. Yeah, yes, yeah. Thank, thank you so much. That's a great one. Regent Perkins. Roberto, thank you, Madam Chair. Just hot mic. Regent Tarkanian. Thank you. Um, thank you. Um, I. I think I explained to, uh, I mentioned to, uh, during the briefing with the uh, doc doctor, Dr. Whitfield, uh, President Whitfield, um, when I first came, when I first was, in, during my election cycle, that was one of the first things that I brought to UNLV was the question of why could we have a station because it's of its proximity to Harry Reid Airport. And I'm just happy that this is finally coming to fruition. And thank you both for working together to make this happen. Thank you. Mr. Frommer, did you have something to add? 
Uh, yes, thank you, uh, Regent Perkins, uh, Regent Boylan through Chair Carvalho, David Fromer, uh, UNLV. Uh, just wanted to highlight that as a part of the board documents, uh, the, uh, and I just want to make this very clear because sometimes these things don't come out quite clearly. Uh, the, the business arrangement related to the fare structure is uh, UNLV is looking to sell the land for a, an appraised value to the boring company. And we are also seeking, we're negotiating to see if we can get some additional funds for some replacement parking. Uh, we've talked with the boring company about the fares, being that this would be a compensated transaction to the institution. And the funds that we would receive, the intent is to try to use a good measure of those to replace lost parking, because that's important to our students as well. Uh, the boring company, uh, I believe in the briefing papers, has a fair structure, generally $6.00 to $12 per trip. Uh, we do have in our discussions with the Boring Company that we would like to see discounts for students, faculties, and, and staff. That is a point of negotiation, but we also acknowledge that it is the sole discretion of the Boring Company to set the fees for their system. We, we can't direct them, but we can certainly negotiate and see if we can get some kind of discount or some kind of pass that allows access that's beneficial to students, faculty, and staff. That is definitely a point of interest and negotiation for UNLV. Thank you. Regent Boylan? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, since we have Mr. Fairbanks here, Shut the doors, don't let him go. <laughs> Let's get the agreement right now, and then we let him go. How's that? Can we do something? Like that? And I'm more interested for the students, because, you know, the adults, not adults, the staff and faculty, they make good money, enough, nice. No, uh, it would be nice if they got it, but mainly the students. So are the doors shut? Where are the cops? The police? Don't let him go. So can we do that, uh, President Whitfield? When you discuss more, Mr. Frommer, I'll, uh, I won't say anything more. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Chair. So uh, David Frommer, for the record, short of creating a hostage situation, we are very, very interested in that negotiation point. Thank you. Thank you. Are there other questions from the regents? I, oh, Regent Del Carlo. Thank you, Chair. Only because I'm from the north, I do read the Las Vegas paper, so I'm familiar with what you've done, but there's gonna be 69 stations. What's the capacity? Because, I mean, these are Teslas that are below ground that are going around, right? Correct. For, for the larger system, we anticipate over 60,000 passengers per hour. Okay. And what's the um, time frame? Because I see, I mean, there must be a priority coming to UNLV for this. See if there's gonna be 69 stations. Wow. What kind of time are we talking? Over the next 10 years, 20 years? Uh, n no, so the timelines are, are really subject to obviously um, approvals from local agencies like the building department uh, and coordinating with, with station owners. Um, but our goal would be to have a machine going to UNLV this year, obviously subject to planning with UNLV and approvals from the local agencies. Um, and then for the larger system, we'd like to build this in a matter of two or three years, not the 10 year horizon that you mentioned. Wow, thank you. Thank you, Regent Del Carlo. Regent Brown? Uh, I just wanted to say that, you know, I've lived in parts of the world where public transportation was all I had. And so I just remember being a student at UNLV and, you know, cramming for things as you're, as you're going in your, in your head, you're driving. And so I think ease of commuting, being able to get a little extra study, um, and hopefully you guys have Wi-Fi down there. And then people will be able to. And so I think this is a, I think, you know, since the county commission is already expanding this, they've already made it a part of the, the blueprint of the valley. I think having our higher ed institution, and I've even heard that there's possibly a, a CSN uh, in future in the future. Um, I think this is all positive for students uh, here in Southern Nevada. Great, and there is full passenger cell service throughout the tunnels as well. So. Thank you. Um, I, I do want to make one comment that uh, there has been some uh, public comment, um, written public comment given for the main board agenda in opposition to this. So I, I did want to make the, the committee members aware of that. Um, and I have some questions um, that are more the, um, specific and technical for, to this project. Um, Given that this is a 24-hour operation, will there be increased um, demands made on our university police services uh, with, with the addition of this station? 
Um, Chair Carvalho, um, uh, Keith Whitfield, President of UNLV. We've had that conversation, and our chief uh, has said that it can be accommodated, that it's basically, because it's on our campus, it's on a part of a route in which they patrol normally anyway, and that, um, too, even if you think of where it is, it, it's not a place where people linger around, and so, you know, safety concerns are a little bit lower, but they are on the map that that can be uh, absorbed into the normal pattern of policing in that area of the, of the campus. Thank you for that response. Um, also, I, I've been having some discussions um, with Mr. Fromer about this, and there has been somewhat of a question about the exact location of where this parcel will be on, in, the, in the parking area. Um, I, I prefer it to be at, in the location that's highlighted in our briefing papers or as close as possible to minimize the impact to parking. Um, so I'd like to put that on, on record that, that I'd prefer to see that. Um, I'm also curious to know what is the impact to the structural integrity to the ground um, where you're going to be digging this tunnel? Yeah, that, that's a great question. Um, so just, I first wanna note that all of our, um, all of our plans uh, for the actual structure of the tunnel um, are stamped by Nevada structural engineers and they are approved by Clark County Building Department. So that's one note. Um, from a surface sort of settlement perspective, um, we expect literally zero settlement uh, or negligible settlement at the surface and we monitor settlement um, with uh, real-time settlement monitoring devices um, above the tunnel at the surface as we tunnel. Um, so any, any surface that there's effectively zero uh, surface settlement, um, and we monitor that in real time, and we've done so on past projects that have shown um, that uh, negligible settlement. Thank you for that response. Regent Cruz Crawford. Thank you, Chair. Just had a question about accessibility. Could you quickly explain the accessibility features? Uh, yes, that, that's another um, great question. Um, so we have um, specific uh, ADA vehicles equipped um, to handle wheelchairs um, uh, and, um, and, and accessible, uh, accessible vehicles uh, equipped to handle wheelchairs, um, different types of vehicles for different levels of accessibility. Um, but again, uh, accessible vehicles that are equipped to handle um, wheelchairs and, and passengers with disabilities. Thank you for that response. Any other questions or comments from regents? Mr. Fromer, did you have something to add? Yes, thank you, Chair Carvalho. And I just wanted to uh, ask uh, uh, Tyler uh, Fairbanks from The Boring Company, uh, perhaps related to the question about security, and I'll give a little context to this, that uh, if we sell the property, it is now under Clark County jurisdiction as opposed to property that we own is under state jurisdiction. So Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department would have some direct jurisdiction there, although there's an interlocal agreement and a great deal of collaboration between Las Vegas Metro and University Police Services. But I might ask uh, Mr. Fairbanks to just share a little bit about uh, their uh, operations in terms of station security uh, related to some of those questions about uh, safety and in particular uh, any impacts on the police force in terms of their uh, activities. So uh, Mr. Fairbanks. Um, great. As a station owned by the Boring Company, um, the Boring Company would uh, hire personnel um, to be on the site 24-7 uh, while, while our station is operating. So there will be Boring Company um, security and then what we call station attendant personnel um, on site uh, at the UNLV station. Um, in addition, um, any, if, any time that the system would potentially be closed, um, there would be a security gate at the portal of the tunnel that wouldn't allow access to any unauthorized vehicles during off hours if there are off hours. Thank you for that clarification. I appreciate that. Okay. Any other questions or comments? This, I think this has been a good discussion. Regent Brown, did you have something? I, just when you were saying, you know, you'd have personnel on site, I just kind of thought, like, where are people parking if they're coming to take the tunnel? So they're going to the airport, they're going to Allegiant Stadium or something. Have, have we designed something with UNLV where passengers can park, get into the, the Teslas and go? Yeah. Uh, Regent uh, Brown through Chair Carvalho, David Fromer for the record. That has been an active part of our discussions. Certainly we could see on a Sunday 
uh, Raiders game or a Saturday Rebels game, the desire to park at the UNLV campus, perhaps even tailgate, and then uh, take the system over to Allegiant Stadium. Uh, our approach to date in the negotiations, and this is to be finalized, is that the station would be operated by, uh, owned and operated by the Boring Company, but the surrounding parking would remain UNLV parking. Uh, one, we need the parking for our day-to-day -day operations for our students and faculty and staff during the week. But secondly, if it does not conflict with student parking demand, which generally the weekends do not, we would see that as an opportunity per perhaps for UNLV to kind of run some kind of operation that might help you know, provide some funding and some capacity and some benefit to UNLV and the community for parking or tailgating. That's still to be worked out, uh, but uh, that's definitely been something on our mind about how could we partner and how could we uh, provide that service and how might that might provide some financial benefits to this arrangement to UNLV. Thank you. Great question. So I just want to reemphasize that I we want to make sure that we limit any going forward limit disruption um, to the UNLV property and and maximize parking for, for our students specifically and, and for UNLV's use. Um, with that, oh, Regent El Carlo. Thank you, Regent Carvalho, or Chair Carvalho. I know when the uh, first one opened, we were invited. It was part of the um, expansion of the convention center down here. I really wanted to see it. I was not able to come, so possibly at a, a future time when we're in the South, maybe if the regions could um, be invited to a uh, tour. I'd, I'd love to, I personally would love to see it. It's hard, I'm having a hard time just conceptualizing and seeing's believing, so thank you. Uh, definitely, um, I think in general, um, getting people on site helps them, get, helps them have a better understanding of what this is. So certainly anytime you're in town, um, we would be happy, happy to have you on site for a tour. That'd be great. I'm going to take you up on it. Thank you. Thank you. Regent Downs. Thank you, Chair Carvalho. Uh, so I'm just going to express my I have a little bit of concern with the loss of parking. Like, I mean, is there the typical um, thing about parking permits at universities? Is there really hunting permits that you can hunt for a parking space? There's no guarantee for parking. Is, that, is there currently a problem in that area of parking? Um, is this going to add to that. I do see the, the benefit of the mass transit and uh, I think there's a lot of positives there and perhaps those benefits outweigh the potential impact. But also I also, uh, I would expect that um, maybe that would relieve some parking needs, I would hope. I don't know if there's any data on that yet. Uh, uh, thank you, Regent Downs through Chair Carvalho. David Fromer for the record. A very good question. Parking is a very sensitive issue on campus, availability, cost, all of those factors. Uh, the net proceeds of the land sale and any negotiations for additional funds are intended to be used by and large for replacement parking. We currently estimate, and this is to be validated, that the sale of the land might impact around 150 parking spaces. So we'd look for replacement parking in that uh, general range. Uh, our strategy we're thinking is, and at a future board meeting this will come before you, is we're looking at the site and the uh, project approach to build the next garage on campus, which uh, currently is being uh, focused on the east side of Maryland Parkway uh, over by Greenspun Hall area, a uh, very high demand area. So we would try to package any funds we could apply in replacement parking, perhaps to adding more spaces to that garage a high demand area. Uh, I do not run or oversee parking at UNLV, which I sometimes uh, thank myself for many times. That's not an easy job. But nonetheless, uh, I think anecdotal observations are that uh, parking pre-pandemic was getting close to capacity, but not quite there. And since then, we have added a, uh, about 800 net new spaces on campus. Uh, the pandemic and some of the online uh, programs available have moderated that demand a bit, so there is room in the system right now, although we look forward to say at some point 
that will start to get near its capacity again. So I think anecdotal information is, is that we are not up against the limit of parking wall at this time. We probably have a little bit of time to get there and we think we can moderate any impacts through replacement of parking with other parking structures that we would package with the loss of parking here to try to replace them. Thank you. Thank you. With that, I will entertain- Madam Chair. Oh yes, please, Regent, Regent Tarkanian. I'm sorry, I, I didn't call on you. That's all right. I, uh, I was looking at the fiscal impact and it says an estimated loss of parking revenue in excess of 25,000. How high do they think that excess might go? In other words, we're not talking about 25,000, we're talking in excess of 25,000. Could it be 50,000? Could it be more? Uh, thank you, uh, Region Tarkanian through Chair Carvalho, David Fromer for the record. Uh, we can certainly get back to you with a more precise estimate of estimated parking uh, revenue loss. I would say generally, and again, not being the expert in UNLV parking, but one of my colleagues, uh, Mr. Mike Lawrence is, and, and Tad McDowell, the Director of Parking. Uh, permit sales are generally the revenue basis for parking, so I think uh, it's not a linear relationship that if you lose a space, you lose X in revenue because I think the model of campus parking is you have so many people who need to park and they buy permits. And the issue comes up when you sell enough permits and enough people are coming at the same time when you run out of parking. So it's kind of an indirect relationship. But if it, uh, if it pleases the regent and the chair and the committee, I would be very happy to go back to my colleague who manages parking to try to get a more, uh, a slightly more precise number than more than 25,000 uh, back through board staff. Thank you very much. Thank you for the question, Regent Darkanian. At this time, I will entertain a motion to approve the sale of a portion of real property located at 4505 South Maryland Parkway. So moved. Second. Uh, motion from Regent Downs, second from Regent Brown. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Item 13, purchase and master lease of real property located at 4700 South Maryland Parkway, UNLV. President Whitfield. Thank you again, Chair Carvalho. Uh, for the record, Keith Whitfield, president of UNLV. So today, UNLV is requesting the approval of the purchase of the University Gateway property. UNLV already owns the second and third floors of that building, which housed the Graduate College and Career Services, and is looking to purchase the remaining property, which consists of the first floor retail space, fourth through seventh of residential floors, the eighth floor residential deck, and the rights to the parking uh, reciprocal easement. The mixed use building elements allow UNLV to revitalize the east side of Maryland Parkway and promote a university branded complex that welcomes students and aligns with the university's infrastructure. As part of the sale, UNLV will enter into a master lease where UNLV would own the property and the seller or the related organization would master lease it, providing annual payments to UNLV while having the rights and obligations to lease all components of the property. With this information in mind, I offer for your consideration. Thank you, President Whitfield. Mr. Frommer, did you have anything to add? Uh, uh, thank you, Chair Carvalho. David Frommer, for the record, I would like to make one minor clarification. Uh, Regent Carvalho brought to my attention uh, a very good point and in, uh, indicating the depth of research of the agenda item. There is one correction I'd like to make for the record. Uh, there's a statement that says a facilities condition will be completed after closing by a third party expert to determine infrastructure stability and identify any or unforeseen conditions. Uh, that statement uh, should be modified to say a facilities condition assessment will be completed prior to 
closing, not after closing. We, and we have identified a property inspection consultant who are, we are ready to have do the property inspection subject to this hearing. Thank you for that correction, Mr. Frommer. Questions, comments from the regents on the committee or those in attendance? Yes, Regent Boylan. Quick question. Uh, firstly, is this the place where the university police have there? That's underneath. Uh, okay, good. Now, uh, the same thing again. Uh, we give it out to somebody else, and then we have no control over it, uh, the property, you know, if we lease it or something. So do we have any um, set procedures to take back the property or make sure they're doing the right thing? It's in the deed. Uh, yes, thank you, Regent Boyle and through Chair Carvalho. David Fromer, for the record, as a part of this approval, we would negotiate not only a purchase and sale agreement to acquire the property, we would purchase, we would negotiate a master lease agreement. Uh, the anticipated terms we've discussed, and this is still subject to negotiation, mm -hmm. is that the seller would come back and have an organization, be it themselves or another uh, group uh, that they work with to uh, master lease it to. Uh, the base term we're looking at is a five-year term, and then there is the possibility of an extension of another five years. And in discussions with uh, the parties, you know, setting up a master lease, operating a property like this, which has 169 residential leases and then about 11 commercial leases, is not a small undertaking. So at a minimum, you probably need five years of a term to make it worth doing, to make any kind of profit off of that. Uh, you know, I think generally speaking, uh, and again, we haven't negotiated this term yet, but this is a residential and commercial property, and right now it operates as a private residential and commercial property. Uh, I think the intent is, is that UNLV would acquire and control the asset, but we would engage this third-party master lease to generate revenue to help pay off the investment as a part of our holdings. Uh, I would say that generally we'd be looking at it operating very similar as it does today as a commercial first level property and then 169 residential leases as a private market non-university affiliated property. So I believe those terms would guide the requirements of the master lease in terms of how it's operated at a quality level consistent with a relatively new and high quality residential and commercial improvement. Thank you, Regent Boylan. Other questions, comments from regents on the committee or in attendance? Well, I, I do have a few questions uh, pertaining to the, the financing of this item. Um, the, so we are, the, the, uh, the plan is to acquire this through um, money that UNLV currently has available. There is no financing involved in this. Can you please um, uh, outline for, for the committee where these funds will come from and your plan um, going forward with this, with, with this amount of money? Uh, Chris Patone, Associate Vice President, Financial Services and Controller. Uh, so the, the source of funds in this case is the unrestricted cash, uh, cash balances that the university has available. And, the and, and so using those funds to acquire the asset, uh, we, 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 the plan is to repay those funds from the revenue generated through the master lease, um, which payback in this case is anticipated about 17 to 20 years based on the anticipated terms. Thank you. And are the source of those funds um, from, from student fees or what is the, the, the origination, what is the source of the funds that you're using? These are unrestricted funds from self-supporting programs, but not student fees, no student fees. Thank you for that clarification. Are there any other questions or comments from regents? I appreciate that, that clarification on the funding of this. Thank you. 
I will entertain a motion uh, to approve a purchase and master lease of real property located at 4700 South Maryland Parkway. Madam Chair, I will make that motion, but before that, can I ask a question of Mr. Wixom? I make the motion to approve. Uh, is that Mr. Martinez, am I allowed to do that? Should we should we take your your motion and then a second and then and then open the floor for discussion? Yes, ma'am. That's thank what you. I was asking. Yes, thank Perfect. You. Yes. I'll so I'll take the motion from Regent Boylan, a second from Regent Brown. Please pose your question. Mr. Wixom, uh, and I'm sure Mr. Klinga also will know this. So the monies that are made from selling property. Could that money be used to answer uh, Chair Carvalho's question? Is it possible that, hey, we made money selling something, then now we can use it to buy something? That's what I would do. I'd sell something and buy something kind of thing. I, I will uh, defer to Mr. Wixom and to our team at UNLV. Uh, thank you, Chair Carvalho, Carvalho and Regent Boylan. Uh, for the record, Michael Wixom, Special and Chief Real Estate Counsel. As I indicated before, there are each institution generally will have a real property acquisition account. In this case, the funds are coming from a different account, which, which is I made mean, from my perspective, that's a financial decision, and certainly it's within the purview of the institution. So I think in this particular situation, and, and Mr. Deton can probably clarify this point, they've opted as a business decision, as a financial decision, to utilize other funds. Uh, thus leaving in place the property acquisition funds for other uses. And, and, and I think given the overall cost of the project, they've elected to finance it in this particular way. And I'm not a judge as to whether or not that's a good thing or a bad thing. I'm not their financial officer. It's certainly within their purview. It's certainly They certainly have the flexibility on an institutional level to, to finance the acquisition in this way. They can do it in several ways, and they've just opted to do, do it in this particular way. Does that answer your question, Mr. Boyle? Regent Boyle, thank you. Yes, yes, it does. Thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Any other questions? We have a motion and a second on the floor. Then I'll call for the vote. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Item number 14. Well, before I get to that, thank you, Mr. Fromer and, and your team at UNLV for that marathon run of, um, of agenda items today. I appreciate it. And a special thank you to Mr. Wixom as well for, for helping us through those. Thank you. Item number 14, sale of real property located at 20 Main Street, Ruth, Nevada. President Sandoval. Thank you, Chair Carvalho, members of the committee, Chancellor Kiaga, for the record, Brian Sandoval, President of the University of Nevada, Reno. Uh, the reason for the requested sale of this property in Ruth, Nevada is twofold. First, the Department of Geological Sciences, what was then known as the Mackey School of Mines, um, there's a little bit of history here with this building, but in any, anyway, received this property as a, as a donor gift. They use, utilize the property as a geology field camp, and the Mackey School of Earth Sciences and Engineering no longer requires a physical field camp. Second, the United States Postal Service previously leased a portion of the building there in Ruth, but that lease ended in May 2021, which has left the building empty since that time. And as I mentioned in my previous remarks today, um, there's there's a pretty extensive maintenance backlog on that building and it's become dilapidated um, as a result of the fact that there, there's been no tenants within that building or no use within that building. And it would it'd be necessary to, to continue to use it to bring it into code compliance, would be, which would cost a lot of money. And obviously um, it wouldn't be a good return as we talk about money in this meeting um, on our return on investment as location is no longer necessary for university activities. So we did receive uh, uh, chancellor's approval to market this surplus property in February of 2021. So it's taken three years to find a buyer. And there's now an acceptable offer, which is obviously contingent upon your approval. That offer is for $20,000. Um, the university is also requesting 
a waiver of the appraisal provision due to the relatively low value of the property and the cost of a commercial appraisal in this region is $5,000. So with the condition of the structure and the significant amount of improvements necessary, it really only has a nominal value. And as I said, we were, I think, fortunate to find someone who was willing to, to pay $20,000 for it. I know the question, uh, Regent Boylan, has come, what are we going to do with the proceeds uh, from the sale of this building? And um, the net proceeds from the sale will support the Mackey School of Earth Science and Engineering Student Fieldwork activity. So it'll go directly to students. So um, the University of Nevada Reno is respectfully requesting the board's approval to sell the property, including the waiver of the appraisal, as the university has no immediate or anticipated needs for a physical structure in Ruth, Nevada, and it is certainly a delightful community population, about 350 uh, near Ely next to the Robinson Mine. It really does have a proud history there, but um, again, we have no use for that. So with that, Madam Chair, thank you, and we'd appreciate your favorable consideration. Thank you, President Sandoval. Are there any comments or questions from the committee members? Regent Towns? Thank you, Chair Cavallo, Regent Downs for the record. So I had a couple of questions. Um, one is, and that's, this is going to sound really naive, but you mentioned it is dilapidated and, and needs a lot of work to be really functional anymore. Uh, what happened that, that it didn't get maintained? Uh, Madam Chair, to you and through you, uh, to, to Regent Downs. So it was maintained. I mean, it, it was an active post office until 2021. And that, that was only one portion of the building. The rest of the building, as I said, was historically used as a field camp. So literally students would use it to, to stay overnight as they went out and did their activities. But then that, you know, I, won't use, I don't think abandoned is the right word. It just wasn't used. And there wasn't a purpose to continue to put money into that building. So once the United States Postal Service chose to vacate its portion of the building there again there wasn't a reason to put money into it so it's an old building a very old building and um, the roof is not well um, and other odd floors all of it would just need to be upgraded for it to be habitable again okay. and if i can continue i mean this is a broader question and maybe mr wixom can can address it this is a, an example to me that I think Mr. Wixom earlier mentioned that the property all technically belongs to Inchi. And where are there conversations like, well, UNR has this property. It's not really useful for UNR's purposes. Is this something GBC would it be able to use before a sale were to commence? I mean, do these conversations happen? If I may, uh, Madam Chair, to you and through you to, to Regent Downs. So, from our perspective, I can't speak for the other campuses. We do have informal conversations uh, with the other campuses. And an example is we did sell property to, I believe, DRI. And we work very closely with Great Basin College, as, as you may recall, with regard to the Mining Center of Excellence and the, um, in the property involved in that. But yes, we do have informal conversations. Certainly, we would prefer for it to go to another institution within, with NG. Um, if that opportunity to were, were to arise, and I, again, I don't want to speak for President Helens, but I don't know if I want to even give a piece of property to her that may need <laughs> six-figure um, cost a to, to bring it back. Yeah, it's kind of called the gift that eats, you know. So, um, thank you. Thank you for that explanation, President Sandoval. Other questions or comments regarding this item? Regent Brown. Um, I'll just say a comment that, um, I mean, look, if you don't need it and you finally found a tenant after three years and hopefully this new tenant will breathe life into a building and add to the community in a way that UNR no longer can or, or needs to, I feel like this is a no brainer and I definitely support just selling it to the new people. President Sandoval, did you want to say something? No, no oh. just thank you. Thank you. Yeah, okay. no, thank you. Thank you. Okay, I don't see any other uh, hands or anyone wanting to speak. So I will en entertain a motion um, to approve the sale of the real property located at 20 Main Street, Ruth, Nevada, that includes the waiver of appraisal provision 
located in the Board of Regents handbook. Yes, ma'am. I mean, yeah, I make a motion to approve that. Yeah. I'll second. Thank I'll you. second it. Oh, okay. I will take a motion from Regent Boylan and a second from Regent Tarkanian. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you, President Sandoval. Um, before we go on to item number 15, I realize this has been a very long meeting so far, and so uh, lunch is ready. Um, I would like to take a 15-minute um, recess. Um, lunch is available through the, the doors behind um, Chancellor Urquiaga. I'd like to ask that, uh, that regents go first um, and... When we come back from that recess, we will we will um, continue with actually item number 17, which will now be item number 16. So uh, thank you. So we'll we'll be back at uh, 1:05. Thank you. The business finance and facilities meeting. We're going to move on to item number 15: uh, access easement for student housing at Nevada State. President Pollard. Good afternoon, Derry and Pollard. For the record, thank you, Madam Chair, for the opportunity. I'd like to invite Senior Vice President for Business Affairs to the podium to speak on behalf of the easement. Thank you, ma'am. Good afternoon, Madam Chair. Uh, Kevin Butler, Nevada State College. So last March, the Board of Regents approved a series of documents that were required to refinance the third-party housing project at Nevada State College. Included in this approval were a, re, a restated ground lease. Now, it's important to understand that the initial ground lease for that project included language that provided access, uh, ingress and easement, uh, ingress and egress uh, to the facility. When those documents were being reviewed for the refinancing, uh, it was determined by the bond, the bond council for excuse me, the council for the bondholders, that that language is better stated in a recorded easement as opposed to a recorded lease. And so we're not asking for anything different. We're just asking for that access in a different format. Thank you, Mr. Butler. Are there any questions or comments for President Pollard or Mr. Butler regarding this change? I will entertain a motion to approve an access easement to provide access and egress for residents, employees, and patrons of the village at Nevada State Student Housing Project. Motion to approve. Thank you, Regent Brown. Is there a second? Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, my mouth's full. Yes, ma'am. Thank Mine too. you. Thank you, Regent Boylan, for the second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 <clears throat> Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Here. So we're going to move to item 17 first. Implementation agreements for a third party sports and event center for youth development on the Nevada State College campus. President Pollard. Thank you, Madam Chair. Deary and Pollard, for the record, I'm very pleased to bring before you an approval for an implementation of a third party sports and event center for youth development on the Nevada State campus. Uh, very important that this is a continuation of a theme of conversations uh, we've been having with the board uh, since my arrival as we look at how we continue to add value uh, to our community and look at ways in which we might enhance uh, the services provided to the community. With that, Madam Chair, with your permission, I would like to ask Senior Vice President Kevin Butler uh, to take the board through the conversation regarding this agenda item, uh, which also, I believe, sets up and frames a future conversation with the next agenda item. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Kevin Butler, Nevada State College. It was a busy um, committee meeting last March because during that same meeting, you also approved the college uh, to uh, have a memorandum of understanding to negotiate the implementation agreements with First Screen Development to place this MG52 center uh, on the Nevada State campus. Uh, to be clear, and I want to be very clear about this, this project um, does not fall within the purview of the next item, which is the Nevada State Campus Lands Corporation, nor uh, is it contemplated that we'll place this uh, facility within the lease that's being requested 
associated with that uh, next agenda item. The MG52 Center contemplates developing uh, our community's youth through athletics with wraparound services in health, wellness, and education. And uh, the center itself will include an 8,500 seat indoor arena for football, soccer, and events. It will also have an indoor aquatic center complete with an Olympic sized swimming pool. Uh, and so just so that you could get a better idea of, of the concept there, there's a brief video uh, that will kind of run you through what this might look like. There is no sound, so you can make up your own music as you go along. I was thinking chariots of fire myself. Seems like it's a lot longer than one minute when there's no music. But we own the copyrights to this soundtrack. And that's pretty much what we're looking at right now uh, in terms of what the facility is envisioned to be. There's still a lot of legwork in terms of design and financing and everything. But within your packet, there's a term sheet that kind of goes over the deal points uh, associated with this project. And I want to highlight a few of those. Uh, uh, this uh, project will have a ground lease of approximately 23 acres uh, with a term of 49 years. Um, that can be extended by mutual agreement between the parties. There will be a base rent that cannot be extended or deferred beyond five years. There will also be additional rents where the college will participate in net operating income above a certain amount. Uh, the college will be reimbursed for you know, its uh, pre-development costs. There are established milestones within the development agreement that ensure that this project moves forward in accordance with the master plan and that there's adequate and sufficient funding for the program, for, for the project. The college will have priority scheduling for college events and activities, and there will be safeguards uh, to ensure that there's no material financial risk to ANSHI related to this project. The college will also record a notice of non-responsibility to prevent any mechanics liens against the college associated with the project, and uh, in, any and all of the proceeds associated with this or derived from this project will be designated to build out the future academic core of the campus, which is guided by the campus's uh, college master plan as well as the strategic plan, both of which are approved by the Board of Regents. And so right now, I kind of want to introduce the, to you Moreland Greenwood, who is the MG in the MG52, founder of Moreland Greenwood Foundation, current president of the Las Vegas chapter of the NFL Alumni Association, to share his vision of this project. So Moreland. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Kevin. And uh, thank you, Dr. Pollard. And uh, so, you know, every time I talk, I like to start from where everything started for me. You know, I, I think uh, I was talking to someone earlier and I was saying that most people think that you were just born, that I was born into the NFL, but I, I was a kid growing up too. And I remember when I was five years old in Jamaica, um, I wanted to help my family. I have seven brothers and four sisters. 
I remember used to walk barefoot on the ground. I remember coming to America um, when I was 11 and talking to my father about how do I become successful. And he said, you can become a doctor or a lawyer. I never told him what I wanted to accomplish. Um, but I, from then, I went on the path of making sure that I was on the honor roll or I honor roll each marking period. My so father was my first mentor. My second mentor was my gym teacher by the name of Russ Sellen. He got me into football um, my junior year uh, in, in high school. Also, he got me to wrestling as well. And I followed the steps that my father told me to do your best at any contest and God would do the rest. I remember after my first year playing football, I got offered a full scholarship to Syracuse. Didn't even know what a scholarship was. Didn't know I could get a scholarship. I remember he was talking to me and he was saying that, Marlon, now I was on the phone with the head coach of Syracuse and he wants to offer you a full scholarship. And I was like, well, does everybody get a scholarship? And he said, no, everybody don't get a scholarship and they don't play football for one year and just get a scholarship. But one of the reasons I got a scholarship so fast was because I was good in football, but I was also on the honor roll or I honor roll each marking period. That's why it's very important that we teach the kids about the importance of education, staying on the right path. Went up to Syracuse, saw how big the campus was, saw um, the opportunity, and that's when I, it, my eyes opened up. And I was like, this is a big deal. You know, I have an opportunity to change my life. And I started 48 consecutive games at Syracuse. And uh, got drafted by the Miami Dolphins, was team captain my senior year. Um, started four years for the Dolphins. And when I, when, when I was able to uh, sign with the Houston Texans, that's when I was able to fulfill my childhood dream of helping my family. And I told them I wanted to do this since I was five. This facility in Syracuse, getting that, getting that scholarship, gave me that opportunity so that I can help my family. So when I finished playing football, all I wanted to do was to be able to create something to be able to be the guidance and leadership and provide for the next generation coming up. The kids coming up looking for how I'm, how I'm going to make, make myself a success so I can help myself and help my family and help my loved ones. And <clears throat> we started the Marlon Green Foundation in 2015. We started out doing free football camps for the kids. We, imp Im we incorporated the NFL alumni guys that come in to teach the kids about the importance of education, staying on the right track, and doing the right thing, and being upstanding members of society. And when we tell them that, they realize, and we tell them we were in the same position that you are. Don't look at us as, as, as anything more than you. We were in the same position that you are when we had the coaches coming in, talking to us, we had our teachers telling us about what we needed to do. And, and one thing that we did, we listened. We listened, and it wasn't, wasn't an overnight thing. I tell them that it took me 21 years to accomplish my childhood dream. I never told anybody. That's a lot of hard work, a lot of dedication, and a lot of just keep keeping and just having faith. But the reward is very great. Now, some of the kids, I tell them, it may not take you that long, but you, you have to have a plan and you have to have a goal and you have to be able to accomplish it. So this, we are very excited and very thankful for the opportunity here so we can help the youth in the community. So we, we can help the, help the college with the internships and, and, and all the different multi-sports that we have there and the mentorship programs, the mental health and behavioral health and tutoring classes and trade schools, entrepreneurship classes, leadership classes, financial literacy, things to help these kids reach their full potential quicker. And that's, that's pretty much um, what we want to do with the, the, uh, the uh, facility. So thank you guys very much. Thank you for that presentation, Mr. Greenwood. Mr. Butler, did you have more to add? Yeah, just a couple of things. Uh, the implementation agreements, uh, thank you. Um, yes, ma'am, Kevin Butler, Nevada State College. Uh, the implementation agreements are all in your package. Um, we we uh, took our time, we negotiated them. I'd like to really acknowledge um, our general counsel, um, Verna Rhodes Ford, uh, third party counsel, um, Mike Wixom, for the system, our financial advisors, WT, for helping to guide the college through the negotiating process. Um, also love to thank the MG52 team uh, for their engaged and uh, cooperative participation in the process. We believe that the results are a fair and thorough set of implementation agreements. 
and request approval in accordance with the agenda. <clears throat> Thank you. Are there any questions or comments from regents on the committee? Regent Boylan? Thank you, ma'am. Uh, this is a great idea, but again, I always ask these questions. What happens when we hand over something? And uh, I'm sure Dr. Pollard, and I'm sure you have no concerns about that. I, I remember talking to this young fellow. He has the same barber as me, you know, which, you know, both of us. And I specifically mentioned that as long as they had some, a soccer field, that's in there, right? Yes. And yes. Yeah, right? <laughs> you still haven't seen my reggae collection. You really remember me then. But yeah, I thought it was great because soccer is football really to me and others in the world. And I thought it was great that we have a guy in football, NFL, and you know, he's going to be doing something good for the kids in soccer also. And of course, when I grow up, I'm going to be built like him. So that's something I appreciate, a healthy person getting some healthy stuff to the younger generation. Dr. Pollard, yes. great job. I'm glad you're doing this. And thank you so for it. Thank you. Yep. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Other questions or comments from regents on the committee or others in attendance? Uh, I'm sorry, Mr. Wixom. Thank you, Chair for Carvalho, for indulging me on this point. I think it's important to respond to a point that Regent Boylet made a <clears throat> moment ago, excuse me, because it relates not only to this agenda item, but to the following agenda item. While, as, as Mr. Butler indicated, they're two discrete items, at the same time, they're interrelated, and it gets to your point about what happens now and what the control is. Just for purposes of the record, if you go to pages, page 21 of 99 on the support materials at section 3.6 of the ground lease, it requires that any development on the project be done only in accordance with design guidelines that are approved by the college. And also, if you go to the development agreement, pages 80 through 81 and 82, sections 2, section 2.3, 2.4, 2.5, and 2.6, they require that the developer come back to Nevada State College and get approval of all of the design specifications and, and everything that happens in terms of the construction has to be approved by Nevada State College. That becomes really important because later you're going to be reviewing uh, the master plan, the new master plan for Nevada State College, a, a new iteration of the master plan. And so what happens procedurally so that you know is that you will approve the master plan and then Nevada State College on a granular level approves what happens on the construction, uh, specifications, size, dimensions, colors, everything that happens on a granular basis is consistent with the overall master plan. So that you need to understand, again, in response to Regent Boylan, that what you do, what you approve today, will be prospectively uh, everything that you've already approved, in the sense that what happens going forward will be consistent with what you've approved. And in that regard, it becomes critical, and, and, and we'll, I'll point this out in connection with the next agenda item, that you understand that the region still maintain control over what happens on the lands themselves by virtue of the fact that you've approved the, uh, uh, the overall master plan and that these documents require that whatever happens on the land is an implementation of the master plan. Does that make sense, Regent Boylan? Ma'am, uh, it does, uh, Mr. Wixom, thank you, because that's always my concern, and you put it very succinctly, so I appreciate that. It helps me a lot. Thank you. Yes, sir, thank you. Thank you for that added clarification. I think it is important to understand these third-party development opportunities, and really they are opportunities for us to move forward with our capital plans in the future for all of our institutions. And, and given the, um, the additional oversight that the LCB audit has, has opened for us, I think it's important for us to understand the, 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 the pathway that you've laid out for us and to continue to have those points in time where these things come back to us and we do understand the status of them at, at, at those points, but also to understand that the master plan guides this and that we as the board do have full control over, over the 
our destiny in terms of these projects. Mr. Wixom. Regent Carvalho, if I may follow up, thank you. And I think uh, <clears throat> in that regard, it's important that this committee understand and the board understands that Nevada State College is being completely transparent in this process. Everything is coming back to you. You can also request reports back from Nevada State College in the future uh, to get a report back on what's happened, what's taking place, uh, to get a confirmation that everything is taking place in the way that you've approved it, which is also important in terms of your control over the project. I know Regent Brown mentioned earlier a question about prevailing wage. Uh, one of the requirements in this development agreement is that prevailing wage be paid. And I think that's important for purposes of approval as well. So thank you. I agree with that. And if, if you hadn't mentioned it, I would, I would mention that um, uh, Mr. Butler pointed out to me that prevailing wage was, was a part of this, um, this agreement. So thank you for that. Um, any other questions, comments? Regent Brown. Thank you so much, um, Regent Brown, for the record. I want to just take a moment to, you know, point out the fact that we have so many people in our society, influencers, sports people, who say they want to give back, and, and they do to their own community, but it sounds like, and it's Mr. Greenwood, correct? Yes. Yeah, it sounds like, Mr. Greenwood, we are not your community, but you've picked us for a very sport, a special reason, so I want to just publicly say thank you. Um, I find that, you know, you wanting to reach back and help kids, but also having a workforce development component, this is kind of a perfect example of what uh, higher, our higher ed institutions should be doing for our community, entering into these public-private partnerships that focus on mentorship, building up sports in our community, and um, you're providing a world-class uh, facility for our institution, and it's just an overall benefit to um, our, our community, so. Okay. Oh, okay, sorry. I just wanted to say thank you, and, and uh, I'm very excited for Nevada State to have this opportunity. Thank you, Regent Brown, and, and I echo that as well. I think it is important for our communities. I, I do see um, community members in the audience, um, the Henderson Chamber president. I don't know if you're here for, for that particular, for this item, but, um, but I, I see the support here for that. Okay, thank you, thank you. Um, Mr. Wixom, I think you have a comment. Yeah, if, if I may, and, and thank you, Regent Brown. I just wanted to not correct, but perhaps clarify. Uh, this is not a partnership. And from a legal perspective, we are not entering into a legal partnership. These are arm's length transactions. And I think that's important for the record to make sure that everybody on the board knows and understands that we, we take great play, pains through our contractual relationships to make sure that, that every, all the parties understand that this isn't a joint venture. We don't have liability in that sense. We, we don't have joint liability. It is not a legal partnership. And sometimes the phrase public-private partnership is attached to these kinds of arrangements as a collo colloquial uh, uh, reference, which is fine. But I think for purposes of the record, we need to clarify that this will not, in fact, be a partnership or any kind of a joint venture. Thank you for that clarification. Um, just for the edification for those on the board, the, the term that I've been told is better to use is a third party development opportunity, just so we are all clear on that. So third party development opportunity, <laughs> have it written down so it's, it's in my head. So thank you for that clarification. I think that that's, that's very important to make that distinction. Are there any other questions? Yes, Regent Del Carlo. Thank you, Chair Carvalho, and I do applaud uh, Mr. Greenwood and, and wanting to give back. I think this is terrific, and I just want to understand, I appreciate your comments just now, uh, uh, Mr. Wixom, but it says under allowable uses, the college shall have a priority right to the use of the Fieldhouse Event Center upon reasonable notice to developer. So I want to make sure this is not a, a way for... Nevada State at this point to get into athletics and this would be their athletic thing, is it? Or is this for the community and then there'll be further negotiations later about using, say, the field house or the event center? So just yeah. a little clarification there. I would Thank actually you. reverse that. I think our priority, uh, Darian Pollard, uh, president for the record, one of the things that's useful for us, to be quite frank, is that this will allow us to actually hold our commencement 
on our campus uh, if we're able to be appropriately scheduled in this facility. So for us, obviously, we see it as a phenomenal opportunity to provide an asset to the community, first of all. Secondly, to allow us to house and have some priority in being able to reserve space there. And then third, you know, as I even look at the board's policy, the board is very clear that you support athletics as a way of really creating opportunity and access for students. That would be something we might explore down the line. But right now, our intentionality is to really find a place to house existing programs that meet the needs of the community, as well as begin to allow us to really shape uh, the development of the more holistically of the campus itself. Thank you very much. I just have one follow-up. I would just recommend, I know a lot of people that go work out have young children, and we have a wonderful recreation center in the community that I live in, and we do have child care with it, so you might want to look at that too. Not a huge one, but just enough for people that are using the facility. Thank you. Thank you, Regent Del Carlo. Thank you for that, Regent Del Carlo. Um, we do have a beautiful new education building on the campus of Nevada State, and so there is that, that child care center there that um, I would offer as an alternative. <clears throat> and I would also say that as, um, as a, a Boulder City resident, and, and Boulder City is part of my constituency, I, I would hope that you would work with Boulder City as well to allow them to use the, the facility. Um, that we have, there's a much smaller uh, group of students there, but um, I think that that would definitely be a um, added benefit to that community as well. Very good, Madam Chair, thank you. Thank you. Any other questions or comments regarding this item? Okay, so this is the, there is a lot to this agenda item. Um, so I I think we're going to take it all in one. I think that's we can do that. Um, <clears throat> so I would um, entertain a motion to approve the following items related to this collaboration, this third party collabor collaboration, which will construct and operate an athletics complex and event center on the Nevada State College campus. Number one, a ground lease agreement between Nevada State College and First Green Development, LLC. Number two, a project development agreement between Nevada State College and First Green Development, LLC. Three, authorizing the Nevada State College Senior Vice President for Finance and Business Operations to approve items related to performance bond allocations on behalf of Nevada State College. Four, authorizing the Nevada State Senior Vice President for Finance and Business Operations to record a notice of non-responsibility. Five, authorizing the Chancellor to negotiate minor non-material modifications to the implementing agreements and to submit a closing certificate to the underwriter. And six, authorizing the Chancellor and or the Nevada State College Senior Vice President for Finance and Business Operations to execute consents and authorizations required for financing documents related to the subject project, including without limitation, a consent and recognition agreement as to the FGD leasehold deed wonderful. trust and certificates of NC office, officer incumbency after review and approval by NC Chief General Counsel or at the Chief General Counsel's request and Chief Special Counsel for Real Estate. So I will entertain that for a motion. I make a motion to approve. That was a mouthful, but I think I got some of it. Thank you. <laughs> it, it's, all in the, it's all in the agenda too. Thank you, Regent Boylan. Is there a second? Second. 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 Oh, I'll take a second from Regent Brown. What's happening? Oh, I'm sorry. I'll, I'll take it from Regent Brown. Um, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. I can't believe that's we're done. It's now time for new business. Are no. there? Oh, I'm sorry. See, that's I, all right. I, that, yeah, I'm sorry. We are now going on to item number 17. That was item 16. I'm sorry. So implement, implementation agreements for a third party. Nope. <laughs> I, I see what I'm doing. Ground lease to Nevada State Campus Lands Corporation, Nevada State. 
President Pollard, my, my deepest apologies for getting it, that all messed up. Not a problem, Madam Chair. Darian Pollard for the record, and again, good afternoon. Uh, this is, uh, I, again, something I'm profoundly proud to uh, bring to you and that we've been working on for quite some time uh, at the direction and request of our internal college community and seeking authority from the board to move forward with this. This is an opportunity for us to move to uh, develop approximately 228 acres of our unimproved campus land on a ground lease basis and to do so through a Nevada State Campus Lands Corporation, which the board approved at its December 2022 meeting. Uh, the intent here is to allow us to develop and monetize a real property assets through a sublease agreements with third parties to help us continue to build the campus in a way that is in accordance with both our strategic plan and the facilities master plan that you will be spending time with tomorrow. And I certainly have the man who knows it all, our Senior Vice President for Business and Finance here to respond and offer a little bit more insight. Mr. Butler. Thank you, boss. And thank you, Chair. Um, so, uh, I mean, I, I think the President laid this out very, very well. Um, tomorrow you'll see a presentation on the comprehensive rewrite of our campus master plan that suggests that um, we can build a vibrant and efficient uh, academic core to serve up to 20,000 students on as, little as 20, uh, on as little as 200 of our 512 acres. So what do we do with the additional real property assets. And uh, as the president indicated, um, this lands corporation um, will help us in, in, in helping to develop and monetize those assets. Um, in addition, there's really two things I, I think that are of significant benefit for the uh, lands corporation. And that is, first of all, they can be very responsive to these third party um, uh, development opportunities as they present themselves to the college. But more importantly, the trusteeship for the corporation has been intentionally constructed uh, to have uh, expertise in the areas of development, architecture, finance, real estate law, and we even have representation from the local surrounding communities to provide that direct input. Um, so, um, Right now, we're asking for a formal allocation of an initial lease of land so that this uh, corporation that was created can get forward and moving with its charge. And uh, in similar, uh, Region Wyland, to the proceeds from the last project, um, you know, Nevada State College has been growing a lot, and we always have a demand for space. So any proceeds um, from resulting projects will be designated again to building out that academic core. And with that, I'm happy to address any questions. Mr. Wixom. Oh. Thank you, uh, Chair Carvalho, Michael Wixom for the record. As a follow-up to the last item on the MG252 lease and this particular item, uh, after consultation with President Pollard and Mr. Butler, uh, we're going to respectfully, well, I need to acknowledge two points. It's been the college's Remembering what Mr. Butler said that the prior lease was for about 28 acres or so. This is a larger property on a ground lease. The expectation is from all parties that all of the subleases be done in conjunction with development agreements that are similar in form and substance to the development agreement that you approved today. And I think it's appropriate that the record reflect that that as if the regents choose to approve this ground lease, it will be approved on the assumption mm -hmm. that there will be similar development agreements for each of the respective subleases. Those development agreements will include the provisions that I referenced earlier in terms of Nevada State College approval of the plans, the specifications, the design specifications for all of these projects that would be consistent with the master plan for the overall project that you will see tomorrow. And it will also include other provisions such as prevailing wage provisions, for example. And it will also include provisions related to notices of non-responsibility, similar in substance to what you've approved. And I think it would be appropriate uh, for the board to acknowledge that fact as part of the approval motion. You could, for example, request that the ground lease to the extent deemed necessary could be amended to, uh, to include that specific requirement 
that any, any subleases be done only in connection with development agreements, similar in form and substance which, to what you've already approved, so that the board has comfort that anything that happens will be developed consistently with what you've already approved. In the same way, you can request updates and approval subsequently to confirm that, in fact, the developments that you've approved are, in fact, proceeding as you approve them. Uh, did that, did, and do I need to clarify that at all, Mr. Butler or President yeah. Pollard? Is that? No, I, I think you and I have had this discussion and it meets with uh, what you and I had discussed. Okay. Uh, thank you for that indulgence. And Madam, thank you. Madam Chair, if I can have yes, one please. more moment. I would like to introduce uh, Scott Mulrath, who is the president of the Henderson Chamber of Commerce, but also, more importantly, we've wrangled him in to actually chair um, this Lands Corporation. So just, um, if you wanted to have a couple of, couple of words. Welcome, President Mulrath. <laughs> Madam Chair, uh, Regents, uh, it's an honor. Uh, we, uh, I can speak on behalf of, behalf of the Commission that we are uh, very excited for what this opportunity represents to advance the vision forward of Nevada State College. Uh, I'm proud to be involved and uh, we're obviously at the very, very front end of uh, what will be a, a long process, but uh, one that will certainly further benefit, again, uh, the growth of the college and in a way that's in alignment with the master plan. So we're, we're very pleased uh, to be a part and uh, we thank you for, for your support of it. Thank you for being here today. Mr. Butler, did you have anything more for us? No, ma'am. No? So we'll open it up to uh, questions and comments from our committee members or other regents um, in attendance. Are there any questions or comments for either um, President Pollard, Mr. M Mr. Butler, Mr. Wixom, certainly Mr. Muehlrauth as well? Quiet. Y'all ate lunch and now you're, you're just... <laughs> Digesting. <laughs> <laughs> okay, then I will entertain a motion um, to approve a ground lease to Nevada State Campus Lands Corporation <clears throat> to include any development that any development will be consistent with previous development agreements, such as the MG52 agreement. Does that satisfy your? Thank you. Thank you. I will entertain a motion on that. Move to approve. Thank you, Regent Brown. Second. Is and a second from Regent Tarkanian. Thank you so much. Sorry, I keep missing you in there. All right. Any other questions or comments? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Great. Thank you Thank very you. much. Congratulations. <clears throat> now we can go on to new business. Okay, does anyone on the committee or any other regions have new business for this committee? Madam Chair? Yes, Regent Boylan. Thank you, ma'am. Now, I may be uh, just being prophetic or something here, which I try hard not to do, but what happens to these uh, agreements, Mr. Wixom, good answer, when the Nevada State College becomes Nevada State University? If it becomes, you know, you know what I mean. So what happens to all these contracts that we are making with Nevada State College? We just move on. Thank you. If I may, Chair Carvalho, Michael Wixon for the record. Uh, Regent Boylan, um, <clears throat> that is an excellent question. We've discussed that issue. I think it's critical, <coughs> pardon me, that if you approve the name change, that in approving the name change, you provide specifically that uh, the successor, the institution, notwithstanding that it has a new name, is, is a successor to all prior contracts and agreements. That would be the general approach contractually that a prior contract, that, that a successor institution or a successor name, an institution with a successor name, would be subject to contracts under a different name. That is procedurally what's happened with the name of the institution. I made reference earlier to legacy contracts that referenced a different name for Anchi, for example, but when Anchi took on a new name, it took it subject to the prior agreements and left the prior agreements in full force and effect. Does that answer your question? 
Yes, sir. That, that will, you just said legacy contracts, and it came poof in my brain, and I'm like, well, I but I, I do you. think it's an important yes. point, Regent Boylan, and I think it's one when you discuss the name change that you identify that for purposes of the record that it's the intent of the board that if the name is changed, that contractual relationships remain intact. Thank you, Mr. Wixom. I appreciate it. Thank you, ma'am. It's a question, sorry. Thank you for the clarification. Regent Del Carlo, did you have new business? New business? Yes. Um, under number um, item number seven talked about the delinquent accounts, and I know there's um, AB 212, so this may want to wait until that bill comes out, but at the point that either does come out or doesn't come out, I'd like to see a presentation to the board on the student uh, delinquencies. There's, I was really shocked, 26,000 students. I thought that was a huge number. So I'd like to see it break, break, broken down by institution and what our processes are. I don't even know that. Do we send stuff out to collection agencies? At what point do we do that? Do we write it off? What's the oldest debt, et cetera? So I just like to have a, just to inform the whole board about all this. Thank you. Thank you for that new business. I think that that's appropriate. Thank you. Any other new business for this committee? I, I have a few items to add. <clears throat> the, the first is I, I would um, request to direct staff to bring back a um, an NCHI, uh real property listing that's held by our, our foundations. I think it's important to have that. Um, I also think that... Um, in regards to the fiscal exceptions report, I feel like we uh, we we tend to get some of the same um, entities, you know, business units, departments, schools, on that report over and over again. And and I wonder if there's a way to revise that policy so that it's it's uh, that report is clearer and more transparent for us. So I'd ask um, our uh, system staff to look into that. I've got one more thing. And then I'd also like to, um, in an effort to increase board's transparency and oversight of third-party development projects, I'm requesting for institutions that have or will have entered into these opportunities to bring back to the committee regular status reports uh, during the life of these projects, whether it's construction or uh, lease. It's, it's important for this committee and the whole board to understand where we're at with these third-party development projects. Um, and Regent Del Carlo, you had something more to add to new business? Uh, just to... Um Go on, to uh, go on with you with the uh, exceptions report. I would find it helpful if when we have the exceptions report once a year to show the, the progression over time. The report I'm talking about is a quarterly report. Oh, I'm talking about, okay. Then okay. this would be the accept, the report, like the, the, uh, the dental practice plan for CSNs on it. If, yeah, that's a quarterly, that's yeah, a quarterly okay. report. Yeah, we, we could just see the time thing over it. Because I know the um, ASU Student Union one at uh, UNR says they're going to have it down by 25. But it would be nice to see where they, so we can see that it's continuously being uh, relieved. Okay, you know what I mean? Thank you. And I just wanted to say for the other one that I asked for, I'm not looking at anything punitive, of course. I just, I know CSN's foundation has made a great statement. I saw it on their um December foundation report that they want their students to graduate debt free. Wouldn't that be a perfect world? And so I just, you know, let's face it, higher education is a business. So, um, you know, in any way we can help students or really understand why there's 26,000 students with debt. Because I know there's a Supreme Court ruling. I don't think, I think that's going to personally get turned down. But uh, so let's go from there and just see if we can help people. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Any other new business? Then I will go to public comment in Elko. Is there any public comment for the Business Finance and Facilities Committee in Elko? There is no comment in Elko. Thank you. Is there any public comment in Reno? There is none in Reno. Thank you. Any public comment in North Las Vegas? Seeing none, I will adjourn this meeting at 153.